But anyway, things are going okay, I guess. Uh, the Clown Museum looks phenomenal. It's amazing. Uh, after 15 years of collecting and six years since I bought the building, put it together, it could not have turned out any better. I mean, if you when you go in the museum, there's so much stuff, and it's like every little speck. You know, there's another picture, another this, and it's all perfectly ordered. You can tell it's like somebody that OCD put this thing together. You know, what I mean, it's very it's very obvious. Uh, although right now I'm in a battle with the city. Uh, it's <laughs> okay. First, okay. I wanted. To, I made this amazing sign. I was gonna hang. Okay, and I went to hang, and they said I had to have a licensed contractor hang it. I'm like, what is? And I wanted to hang it over this other sign that was there to give it a three dimensional look. So then I thought, okay, I'm gonna make this smaller sign. I'll get the permit for that one easily, and then I'll just kind of maybe put the other one up and kind of go from there. I bring in. I try to get this little sign. It's like like maybe a foot and a half by five feet. You know, it says California Clown Museum. It's it's no. It's like no big deal at all. It's like they're giving me shit about it. I can't even hang it. So I'd have to have a license. Con I figured I'd have a license contract for that one too. So I got a friend of mine to do it for me. And then he goes there and then they tell him, oh no, you have to write it up on paper. So he writes it up real nice. And says, oh no, it has to be like an architectural. And back and forth. It's been like four weeks now and you can't hang the th thing. And I can't go forward with like the fire permits and all that until that's taken care of. It's ridiculous. Anybody that thinks we still have the free enterprise system in this country needs to try to open a business in California. It's absolutely ridiculous. You know, and here's the thing, man. It's like, you don't see many new businesses coming into California. Like, like just like, well, new businesses you'll see, but you won't see like just, you know, small businesses, average, average people that save up their money and they want to like put something together, a restaurant, a shop, whatever. You don't see many of those because they get bogged down with all the bullshit nonsense, you know, bureaucracy, whatever you want to call it. So that's why you, when you see new stuff coming, it's always like, you know, big corporations, you know, the Walmart. March Walgreens, you know, Burger King, McDonald's, whatever, because these are big companies that have the big money, okay, that can hire the big lawyers that show up in their $1,000 suits, and they show up to the city planners or the city halls, and they're like, no, 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 we're going to do it this way, and that's the way it's going to be, or we're going to be seeing a judge. No, no, no. See, they have the money to do that, and your average person doesn't have the money to do that. It's absolutely ridiculous. But I will get open. I mean, the, it's, I'm in a it's zone for a museum. Another thing that happened, it's like my luck. The city planner that I talked to like six years ago before I even decided to open in Barstow, okay, was all for the ideas. Like, oh yeah, this will be cool. Yeah, the city wants museums. You know, we sent emails back and forth. Then I didn't hear from him anymore. I'd give him a brochure and I know what's up. Now I find out the guy retired. So now I'm dealing with a whole different pe group of people who didn't know anything about the clown museum. But, you know, I met with the president of the chamber of commerce. I'm gonna try to meet with the mayor and I'll, I'll get it going eventually. But it's just, it's just ridiculous. And I mean, I've heard of this happening to other people who try to build businesses. They make it so hard. It's just ridiculous. You know, okay, in California, they'll say they don't, you know, they'll cry about, oh, the homelessness is so, the homelessness is so terrible. We got to build housing, got to build housing. How about this? How about letting people open businesses so they can supply jobs, so these people can get a job and have some pride and rent an apartment or buy a house? I mean, wouldn't that be a better idea? But, they, you know, they just don't get it. It amazes me that, Okay, you know what, 40, 50 years ago, we go to war with Vietnam, okay, to end the hideous communism. Like 50,000 Americans die, and like, what, a million v Vietnamese die, okay? And now they got more free enterprise going on over there than we do here. I mean, how does that happen? You want to open a business, I've been to Vietnam. You want to open a business in Vietnam, you, know, you, do, you lease a building, throw up a sign, put your merchandise in there, and you're, you're open. That's the end of it, and fork out 20% or something to the government, you know, maybe more if you make more, which is less than we pay in taxes. Okay, and this is a communist country. I mean, you want, you know, people wonder, how did Trump win? Well, this is why Trump won. People are tired of this bullshit. Now, anyway, I didn't, I didn't mean to go off on a, on a you know, a, whatever you want to call it, a right? tantrum, thank you. Thank you. But it's just frustrating. I've been busting my ass on this thing. It's so amazing. And here's the thing. This museum will do so much for the city. It doesn't just bring like, okay, circulate money within the city. It brings outside money into the city. And I don't know if you know Barcelona. It's just a little town. Everybody stops there on the way to Vegas, and then they go to Vegas. All the little motels will benefit. All the restaurants, everything, everybody will benefit by this. And yet it's just like the city doesn't even, they don't even get it, man. You know, it's, it's, this is crazy. But anyway, I don't want to, you know, spend this whole time talking that, about that, but uh, it, it's just, it can be frustrating, you know. But I, I will work, but you know what? It's not just Barstow though, because I got rejected from a lot of areas in the LA area who didn't even want the museum, 
okay? But plus, I couldn't afford it because I could never afford a building that big, you know, out here for the size of the building I got there. But anyway, I will get open, and I'm going to push a plug for myself. So anybody who wants to see it, go to CaliforniaClown.com. You can see the website. I got a social media manager that throws all the stuff out there on all those formats. I don't know anything about that. And you know what I really need, which would be great? I wish, like, somebody, if somebody from Netflix is watching this or Hulu or something, a reality show out of the Clown Museum would be amazing. I mean, can you imagine the, the different plots and storylines you come up with? Because clowns are pretty crazy anyway. The owner of the place is, has obsessive compulsive disorder. I mean, it's like be a perfect thing. So anyway, but enough, enough on that. Now, last time when we talked, I got in about, it was mostly about my childhood and growing up with OCD. And I kind of wish that I would have stopped like right after, like when I joined the Navy because there's a lot of stuff on that that I hadn't really talked about of what actually happened when I got into the military because we just didn't have time to get into all that. So I just want to, I'm going to touch base a little on that. Uh, so anyway, I, uh, as, as for anybody that watched the last one knows, completely crazy at that time with obsessive compulsive disorder, just 24 seven bombarding my brain. And I, it was basically like I couldn't almost do, I couldn't do anything really. It was just, that's all I did. So I ended up joining the military. I think I t we did touch on this in the last one. When I got there, it was like really easy. It was, I mean, it was great because like a boot camp, everything had to be exactly the certain way, you know, and, and, and with obsessive compulsive disorder, that's how you, we want everything exactly, perfectly straight. You don't want any questions this way, that way, or you'll be there for hours straightening something. So all that was well. And so at first it was great. I mean, it's like I, I won the push-up contest. I was athletic party officer. And it's like, you know, things were okay. And I, my plan was to do four years in the military, okay, which I would have, I, I mean, I would have, I rather would have went to college, but I didn't have a problem with the military either because I am very patriotic. I grew up in Pennsylvania, which is a very patriotic state. So, you know, it was like, okay, I can't go to college. It's, you know, not going to happen. So I'll just, you know, join the military. And that was my plan, do the four years. I didn't want to spend like 20 years there or anything and then move on. And at some point, I don't know, at boot camp or something. I don't know where, when it happened. I realized that I was counting up the years and I realized that I'm going to be getting out when I'm 23. And at that time, I was what, 19? And I was like, 23 sounded so old. And I was like, it like scared me. I was like, oh my God, I'll be 23. I'm going to be so old, so old. Now you look at that, you're like, it's ridiculous. But at the time, it really scared me. And so then the OCD kicked in and OCD said to me, you know, it started using the thing that you're going to stay in the Navy for the rest of your life. You're never going to get out. You're going to be here for like 20 years. You won't be out till you're like 40. And that just like, all of a sudden that became the new big fear in my life. And I was like terrified of that. And, and it was, it was, I kind of like shook it off at first, you know, but it just kept like OCD. It just kept building and building and building, getting stronger and stronger and stronger. The more I was in the military, I got to a school. Okay. And when I got to a school, now, going in, I didn't even have a school, okay? But when I went, obviously, they found something about me that told them, you know, this guy, you know, he could, you know he's going to make it to one of our schools. So they sent me to storekeeper school. And, uh, and the first test was fine. I think I aced it, okay? And then after that, the OCD started kicking in more. And what it was was, I could, I, like I talked about in the last one, I could barely read. Sometimes I couldn't read at all, okay? And, like, like I, I don't know if anybody saw it before when I explained that. It's like I know how to read. Okay, like a paraplegic knows how to walk, but he can't walk. OCD is the same way. It'll just stop you in your tracks and will not let you to go forward because you got to see the right, right word, right, you know, whatever, color, whatever it is. And so now I had this fear of staying in the Navy for the rest of my life, which terrified. So every time I thought that, I had to offset it by saying, no, I'm, I'm going to get out and be successful. I'm going to get out and be successful. I would have to say that over and over again every time I thought of the Navy. Now, I'm in the Navy, so that's like an impossible situation, okay? And... So anyway, I'm at age school, and then from there, it just got worse and worse and worse. I couldn't even, I, I, I couldn't even take that. I couldn't even learn. And, and then to make things worse, there was really no instruction. Like, I could do better in school if there's a teacher and they're talking and you could, like, memorize. I could do that. But it was just like you had to just read from, a, from like, a – it wasn't even a computer screen. Then we used micro uh, – whatever it was, those little short films you used to use, microchips or whatever it's called. And, and then structures, whenever I asked for help, you know, I'd be like, I don't really get this. He'd be like, oh, just read it, just read it. And I couldn't read. <laughs> so I'm like, what the fuck? And it was horrible. I'd sit in that class and just like, it was, it was terrible. And I just, of course, I flunked out of the thing. There was no way. And one time, 
I mean, they just thought I was lazy. Of course, why wouldn't they? One time the guy, in order to motivate me, it was like pouring rain out. And he said, oh, I'm going to get something to motivate him. He sent me outside to dig a ditch, okay, in the rain at the, at the back of the, like, the building to dig this ditch. You know, show, and you, you know, anybody would be like, what the, would be like, oh, I'm going to study. I'm going to learn. I'm not going to be out here in the cold digging a ditch. I was so happy to do that because now at least I just wasn't sitting there with my mind just like freaking my head like it's going to be crushed, you know. So I was and I, I just I loved it. I sit there. I was like, oh, my God, at least I'm doing something now. So I dug this like perfect trench diameters, everything right. And he comes out. I'm like, hey, what do you think? He's like, yeah, this is really nice. He was like surprised. Yeah, this is nice. He's like. You know, and then, and I was like, if you needed more of this, man, let me know. And he went back in. I heard him talking to one of the other guys. He's like, he enjoyed it. He wanted to do that. You know, <laughs> it was like, they couldn't figure that out, you know, because nobody knew I was crazy. I didn't, you know, I'm not going to tell anybody. And uh, anyway, I even, and once, once I got tossed out of A school, it got to the point where I just knew it. I just wanted to get dropped out of it because I couldn't sit in that room and just let my mind completely drive me crazy the whole time. And uh, I met one of the one of the uh, senior chiefs that said to me, he's like, what do you want to do? You want to dig ditches the rest of your life? And I said to him, you want that kind of work? Oh, he'd asked me, he'd said, why'd you even join the Navy? And I said, for a career. And he thought I meant like a career in the Navy, but I meant like a career, get some kind of a trade or something. I don't know what it was. And uh, he's like, what do you want? You want to dig ditches the rest of your life? I'm like, that kind of work? And I'm like, well, yeah. And he's just like, what the? You know what I mean? It was like, he, he couldn't he, he couldn't even, and which made sense, you know? I mean, no, I didn't want to do that, but, you know, it was better than where I was because my brain was completely just destroyed. So I had to have, at least when I was doing something, you know, I, I wouldn't be, my brain, because with OCD, it's like the worst thing you can be is just like sitting idle, like with nothing to occupy your time with. That's why like I'll work like crazy all the time, okay? Because you do not want to be just like sitting idle. And back then, to just sit and relax was an impossibility. You couldn't sit and watch a TV show and relax. Yeah, it was constantly, constantly bombarding your brain. So anyway, after that, I ended up getting, went to a ship. And uh, <laughs> the first day I got on my ship, they were in the middle of some major inspection coming up. So it was like horrible, like working 24 seven, which sucked. And again, I'm doing like manual labor things. It's still like, anyway, the OCD just kept pounding at me and pounding at me. Then another thing that happened was, okay, I had a cauliflower ear I got from wrestling in high school. Like today, I love it. It's a, it's a, it's a you know, it's a badge of honor. I'll show it off to people. If I ever get somebody like wants to start some shit from me, I'm like, oh yeah, dude, when you get one of these, you can talk shit, you know? But at the time then, I was like, I was very self-conscious of it because now I had short hair in the military, okay, where your ear was exposed and I was very self-conscious. I would even like sit so people couldn't see it, you know, it was like, I was like, you know, like, you know, cause I was like, like I went on to last time before, I was very good looking. I know that's very arrogant to say, but reality is I was, and I, till my hair fell out, like I said the last time. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, I had this, and that became an obsession too. And uh, when I was at A school, before I went to my ship, I went to see if the Navy could fix it. The Navy, and like I say, let me say this too, the military gave me so many opportunities, so many times, got me into A school. They were, I mean, they were just like constantly, but OCD just kept ripping everything, just kept throwing it, just fucking up everything for me, every time. And anyway, so I went, they actually had me go all the way to Bethesda and a doctor said, yeah, I'll do the surgery. You know, I think they, they wanted it because of this experience to do that. Okay, so I got to my ship and I was gonna have surgery on my ear. But anyway, I got to the ship and uh, it was, I mean, I had friends there and it was cool. You know, for a while there, it was okay. I was keeping the OCD under control. You know, I, I planned on, I was definitely not planning on leaving. I was going to, of course, do, you know, do my time and, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, I had some good friends in that, but it just, the OCD just kept getting worse and worse. And it became things like, like seeing a chief. And, and like, I admire chiefs. The chief is a guy, he's an enlisted guy for one. He's not even an officer. He dedicates his entire life to the military. I greatly like admire these men and women that do this. And back then, because it was a chief, it would set a rage of fear through my body. Like I'd be terrified because, oh my gosh, I, I, have to, you know, I have to think of like some civilian successful guy to offset seeing a chief. And I'm in the military trying to do this. I would have, if I saw something military, I would have to find something civilian to look at over and over and over again 
to offset what it's like an impossible situation. There's there's no I mean, I, I don't know how it lasted as long as I did, to be honest. I seriously don't. But anyway, I'm going back. I'm I'm I'm, I'm so then I start doing the surgery on my ear and I'm going back and forth. And it is totally different when you go to and, and the military treats you so good too. The hospitals and that the care, it was just everything was perfect, you know. And the guy did a really great job. And I was gonna be three operations. When I first when I first got in the military, like the first time I walked on my ship, okay. Everywhere you walk, you smell marijuana, okay? It was just like everybody was getting high all over the ship constantly, okay? And I was like, I was like, a, like you know, like I said before, I was like a jock, you know, a football player, a wrestler. I didn't do any drugs or anything. I, I had a short time when I tried marijuana with some girls, but I was still very much, you know, and I'm not even proud of the way that I was back then because I could care less who does drugs or whatever. Uh, but I was very like, you know, alcohol was okay, but I was very pro, you know, you know, healthy and working out with weights and that kind of thing. And I didn't like that. I was like, so this is the military guys are getting high everywhere. This is bullshit. I didn't like that. So that made it seem more negative. Like, oh God, I don't want to stay here the rest of my life, that kind of thing. But then the Navy did come back and they come in, they, find, they, they cut down on that shortly after I was in. They cut down on it big time. Like they came out with this no more marijuana and it stopped. They did. You didn't smell it on the ships anymore. Now, before like guys would openly get high on the ship and they didn't do shit okay they, they, you know it just they let it go but now it was like okay and it, and it, enough of this you know i think i think the higher-ups were like the vietnam war is over because there's drugs like crazy in the vietnam war as i'm sure you know and the listeners know and after that and they finally said all right enough of this we this we can't have this and they did they cut down on you you didn't see it anymore and if guys got caught smoking marijuana you got in some deep shit you know you were you like lost rank and the big fine and we're on restriction, whatever. Now I think if you get caught smoking marijuana, I think you get kicked out instantly. There's no, no. But I don't know how that works. Like say, like marijuana is legal in California. So if you're in the military and you're in California, you're allowed to get high. I, I don't even know how that works now. Probably not because they have their own laws. I don't know. But anyway, I was home on leave once and I did something really stupid. I don't know why I even did that. I think I was just trying to maybe not fit in, but just bring back, I don't know. I was, I was hanging out with some old friends I knew from high school and there was this party. I, and it started out, I took a Quaalude once. Okay, I was just at a party somebody gave me, I don't know why, I just did it, okay? And I will say this for that Quaalude, it had no effect on me whatsoever. I didn't feel any different at all. But the next morning when I woke up, man, a friend of mine looked over at me and he said, said, man, that's the thing about Quaalude. When you wake up, you just feel so good. And he was right, man. I have never in my entire life ever woke up and so, felt so rested as I did that day. I woke up and it's like, kind of, you felt like Superman. Like, it's like, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> just felt like so, so like strong and rested and well slept. You know, anyway, I never did it again. But <laughs> I'll just remember that. But anyway, that was like the first time I did any, I guess would be a hard drug. And then I was at this other party. I was back again. It was during the time when I was in my ear worked on. I was getting a lot of time off. And I went to this party and I took acid. And, and that, oh, was, okay. With the obsessive compulsive, like with obsessive compulsive disorder, I can't even, I mean, even drinking is dangerous. Smoking marijuana is extremely dangerous because your mind is just, it cannot, I ha, my mind has to be clear and fresh and crisp at all times. I cannot be fucking with my mind at all, okay? And so I take the ass, I took one, not one, but I took another one. Okay, at first it was great. I was old friends of mine and we were just like laughing our heads off, laughing, out, just like we did when we were little kids. Okay, there were these couple guys my brother and I would hang out with in the neighborhood we grew up and we just did everything together. All summer long, we were up till five in the morning, you know, watching old movies, African Queen and whatever, you know, or a Mad Mad World, you know, all those old movies. And we'd be at the beach on Lake Erie all day long, you know, it was just like, and we'd laugh, at least like kids, you know, we get into all kinds of crazy shit together. And it was just like that. And then the OCD started kicking in and the old fears of you're gonna kill somebody started entering my head and I'm on acid now, which like what, like times things by like a thousand or something. I'm fucking terrified, man. And I'm fucking tripping out of my brain, right? And, and I'm looking around and I just see people start getting mad. Okay, and then another guy gets mad, another guy gets mad, another, and it's going around like this, and it's speeding up, it's going faster and faster. And I'm like, shit, it's gonna come to you. And I, and I pictured me like murdering everybody in the room, they're all laying there, and I'm fucking terrified. I'm like, what? and I'm fucking tripping, man, I can't, I mean, it's bad enough when you have OCD, and you're, you're not on any drugs, and you have these fucking thoughts, and, and you counter them, and I couldn't counter them. And, and a friend of mine came up, and he's like, 
He's like, you see what's happening, man? You see what's happening, Steve? And I'm like, I'm like, fuck, he's, I'm like, yeah, I know, I know. I'm like, oh God, he knows that he knows it's coming. There's going to be something bad happening. Then there was this friend of mine that I knew in high school, big, huge guy. He was a second in the state heavyweight wrestler. And I see him freaking out. I'm like, oh shit. I'm like, I'm like, oh my God, it's just going to be, a, it's going to be horrible. It's going to be a bloodbath. Everybody's going to be murdered here. Everybody's going to be dead. Everybody's going to kill each other. And then, uh, then I look over at this other guy I knew. I, there were these two twins there. And then this other guy, I can't remember if it was one of the twins or this other guy. I looked over and a dude had a head like a tiger. And he's like, How? and I was like, then that was it. I was like, fuck, I got to get out of here. So I went to leave and... Uh, and somebody said, where are you going, Steve? It's like, I got to go. I got to go. And I just left. I'm like running in the fucking streets of this neighborhood. I'm fucking crazy. I think, man, I'm, I, I want to be like tied down on a fucking, you know, you know, a bed in a straight jacket or some shit so I can't hurt him because I am terrified that I'm going to fucking kill somebody or something. And I'm not mad at anybody. I'm not angry or anything, but I'm just, that OCD is fucking bombarding my brain telling me you're going to kill somebody. And I can't say enough times, I'm going to save somebody's life, save somebody's life, save somebody's life, save somebody's life. That ain't working <laughs> because I'm on acid, man, and it's just fucking at me at nonstop like it never did before, and I'm fucking... Thank God I didn't have a gun. I might have blown my fucking brains out at that point. I don't know. I was fucking terrified. I don't know if I would have blown my brains out, but I was fucked up. So I run to some random person's house, right, to try to get some help, something, because I literally thought I was going to fucking kill somebody. And and these people are like, terror. They're like, what the fuck? They're like terrified. Some fucking, you know, drugged up fucking kid shows up at their house at two in the morning or whatever the fuck it was. And I remember the little kids came down. They're trying to look. And I remember I kept saying I wanted to shake the guy's hand to show him I wasn't going to hurt him. He's like, oh, that's okay. That's okay. Then, I just, then I just knew, get out of there, because I feared they were, you know, I just left, because I feared they are going to call the police or something. And then I went to another house and had me a friend I went to high school with. Okay. And I'm telling him, he's like, he's like, calm down, man. Calm down. I get it. It's all right. It's all right. I'm like, have you ever do this shit? He's like, yeah, yeah. It's all right. Calm down. Calm down. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? He's helping me out. I go, take me home. Just take me to go home. Take me home. Take me home. Take me to my father's house. Take me home. He's like, all right, I will. I will. I will. And the guy took me all the way home. I wake my dad up in the middle of the night and my dad, with the flaws that he had, he does have a degree in uh, social work and sociology, so he was a good person to talk to while you're tripping out like this. And I'm, and I'm, so I'm talking to him, and while, okay, at one point, I was outside taking a piss. My dad had been remodeling this old house, and all the wires, right, were like big black snakes. And they're going like this fucking everywhere. I'm terrified fight of fucking snakes but i just looked at him i just went that's not real it's not real i just said to myself it's not fucking real it's not real and i just ignored it and i'm talking to my dad right and uh at one point he almost started to cry though okay and you and from the last from the last video if anybody watched it they know what happened the relationship with my father and you know whatever anyway uh and also my father starts turning into the devil like his whole face is like turning into the devil. And I'm like, and I'm looking, I'm just saying to myself, that's not real, it's not real. And I'm looking, he's like turning into the devil. And anyway, I ended up, he calmed me down enough and I left, I went back to the party. And it was like, I was like, I don't know, at least five to, five to 10 miles away. I don't know, I walked back, okay. Anyway, I get back to the party and there's still people out partying and shit, okay. Now, before I go further with that, when I look back on that experience now of my father turning into the devil, I'm looking at him. I look at that now and I say to myself, that was my mind telling me your father's a fucking piece of shit. He is the devil. What he did to you, your stepmother fucking rapes you. He throws you out of the fucking house. The only man you had in your life. It's like, it was your mind telling you this man is not a good man. He's a fucking piece of shit for what he did to you. It was almost like the drug was telling me that at that time. That's how I look back on it now. I didn't think of that then, but now even like recently I've thought of that experience and that's how I look at it. Anyway, I go back to the party and there's people still all fucked up. So that's another thing too that like, Back in those days, okay, I mean, drinking and driving wasn't even an issue. I mean, if you got if a cop pulled you over and you were drunk or something, you didn't get a fucking ticket. They make your parents come pick you up. That happened to me once, you know, and they didn't do shit. You know what I mean? It was, it was, and which, which is good that they do now because a lot of teenagers lost their lives and became paraplegics and all that kind of stuff. But it was a high school thing where, you know, every weekend there was a big keg party and everybody was blasted. Now, we didn't, now the group I was with didn't really do many drugs, okay? That wasn't a thing. But I've been out of school like a couple years now. And now the drug thing was entering entering the groups, the people that I was with, where before nobody did that kind of stuff. And now that was becoming part of the thing. But I remember, I remember this one thing at the party and I was still fucked. I'm still tripping too. I'm still fucked up, but I'm not as bad as I was the night before. But there was this table at the party, this picnic table, and it was red, right? And I remember somebody saying, I swear that table was red last night. And I was like, yeah, it was, but it wasn't red in the morning. But anyway, uh, 
after anyway, after that, I ended up going home to my to, went back to my mother's house. I think I, I told her about it. She gave me something to eat, and then I, and then I was worried. Oh my God, what if I never come down from this? What if I stay fucked up like this my whole life? It never, you know. I remember I talked. To, I went to some friend's house first. She's like, "You're still tripping." I'm like, "Yeah, what the fuck?" But I, I wasn't to the point where I was at, at the worst of it that night. And then anyway, after my mom gave me something to eat, I mean, I laid down on the bed and I fell asleep. Then I woke up and it was over. It was gone. I was back to normal. I was like, "Thank God." And that that was pretty much it. Never again. No drugs. No marijuana. No nothing. Shortly after that, I completely quit drinking alcohol. But the thing when I stopped drinking alcohol, that wasn't re- that was really a matter that I don't like the taste of alcohol. That's all that is. I'm not a pruder. I have no you know. I'll even like if I'm at a party or I'm at a, somebody's house and somebody actually offers me a glass of wine. Or, I'm not going to be rude. I'll take it and drink it, even though I don't like how it tastes. Like if somebody handed me a kind of food I don't like, I'd still just eat it to be polite. Like I don't drink milk either because I don't like how it tastes. That's all it is with alcohol. But anyway, there was that thing. Anyway, I got back on my ship then, and I was just I, from that whole experience, I was pretty fucked up. Okay, but I was like, just felt like shit. And I still kept lifting weights and that. And that's when I became this really like, you know, I knew at that point I cannot be fucking around with anything in my brain at all. You know, I knew that much. Still didn't know what I had. Didn't know what this whole crazy thing was that I was doing. And I remember I had one attack on the ship that was really bad. I remember, I don't know, it was, I saw a chief or something. And I was just like, again, I had to keep saying the rituals, you know. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I wanna get out of the Navy, I'm gonna be successful. I wanna get out of the Navy. I would have to have, keep after saying that, I'm gonna get out of the Navy, I'll be successful. I'm gonna get out of the Navy, to offset where my brain kept saying, you're gonna stay in the Navy forever, you're gonna stay in the Navy forever, you're gonna stay in the Navy forever. Constantly, it's bombarding my brain, everything I saw. And I, was, and I don't know, I couldn't catch up to one of these attacks and I'm all fucked up. And this guy, one of the guys in my, uh, uh, I don't know whether you call it company or what anymore, division. Or whatever. He said to me, he noticed, and this guy used to be a social worker too. And he said, he's like, Steve, you all right, man? What's, what's going on? And he must have saw I was crying, you know. And I was like, no, I'm all right. He's like, you sure, man? You sure you're okay? So there were people that, you know, were out there that, you know, would help me. So anyway, I just said, no, no, nothing. But anyway, uh, without dragging this on too much, uh, my doctor in Bethesda was so cool, this plastic surgery. I said, I said to him once, I go, and he was giving me like all this, like, long leave breaks after the surgery, like two weeks, three weeks. And I said to him, he was a really cool guy. And he didn't like the military either for some reason. He was a doctor and for some reason it wasn't working for him because I remember he had commented to me a couple of times, I'm not glad to get out of here. I think he just wanted to get into, he's a plastic surgeon. He wanted to get into private business and probably wanted to start making his millions. He was done with it. I don't know what the whole situation there was. So there was like no love lost with him in the military. And he said to me, uh, or I said to him, I said, hey, can you get me off my ship? He's like, yeah, yeah, I'll just make your leave so it's like a month, man, and you're, you're automatically off of it. I'm like, oh, cool. So now I was going to get off the ship, which was cool, because shore duty is always much better anyway. Okay, and then I'm about, we're, we were, we were going to go on a three-month cruise, and I was supposed to get off the ship. And for some weird reason, the chief on our ship, this dude just did not, he actually, what it was was he did like me. Because when I first got there, before the OCD kicked in, okay, they saw a lot of potential in me, okay? And like, I had opportunities, like they wanted to send me to ship swimmer school. That's the guy that like, if somebody, like they saw that I was athletic and all that, and they, that's the school where like, you go to a special school, and then for, they, you're the guy, like if somebody falls overboard on the ship, you're the guy that jumps in the water and saves them. That's what you do. They were going to send me to that school. They said this other guy, and they wanted to send me too. But then I was, I was so fucked up, I couldn't even do that. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, there were so many opportunities I had. And then another side of that is if you go to that ship swimmer school, if you're good, some of, not, I'm not saying this would have happened. You know, well, actually, if I hadn't had OCD, it may have very likely happened. I don't know for sure. So I don't want the viewers to think I'm trying to say, oh, could have this, could have that, because I don't know. But at that ship swimmer school, if you're really good, a lot of those guys, they pick out and they send them to the SEAL school. It's, that's, that's how a lot of them are recruited. It's just, re- I, like I said, I never even made it to the ship swimmer school because so I was fucked up. But anyway, uh, and, and he somehow they did something, contacted some, did something, like talked to one of the officers, and they, made, they, they canceled my surgery so I couldn't go. All right, I'm like, and now I almost went AWOL then. I was so fucked up. Because you got to remember, I am so fucking crazy with OCD. And the ship is causing so many OCD. It got so bad, okay, to one point where I became a complete loner. I couldn't even have any friends in the military. Because if I had a friend in the military, I would have to have a civilian friend to offset the friend in the military. Or else I would stay in forever. It was that bad, okay? Completely, you had a completely crazy person in the military. There's no doubt. And, I'm, and, I'm, and it's just, anyway... Which I'm actually glad they did cancel it because, all right, first of all, when you go out to sea, it's, it does suck. You work 24-7, 
You know, you're lucky to get four hours of sleep at night. It's just, just the way it is. But it's a cool experience too, though. And one thing I will say, it was neat too because we went to like Germany, the Nether, the Netherlands. Uh, well, Nether, we went to Germany, the Netherlands, we went to Amsterdam, we went to Norway. And that was cool because I hadn't been to those places. But traveling the military ain't the same as traveling on your own, just going there. It's, that's a whole other thing. I'll get into that later. It's not the same as when you just travel on your own. Uh, but anyway, I'm kind of losing track of where I was here. But, and, oh, I know what I was going to say. One thing that is really cool, the first time I saw a refueling at sea at night, okay, man, this shit is fucking crazy. Okay, first of all, they wake you up at like 2 in the fucking morning, you know, and you had not slept anyway. And uh, it's pitch black out. You're in the middle of the ocean, right? And, uh, and all of a sudden, way in the distance, you see another ship. And then your ship's here, right? And all of a sudden, they start coming closer. And all of a sudden, you hear this music blasting out of their ship. Born to be wild. And then our starts playing the Lone Ranger. Dun, 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 dun. And the ships are coming in. And the music is loud. It's blasting out in the ocean. And the ships come together like this. And there's this massive wake of water shooting up in the middle. You fall in that thing, you're fucking done, man. And they, these guys that are that are uh, steering the ships, amazing. The, these helmsmen, the way they can control these ships, not colliding into each other. It's fucking phenomenal. The skill these guys have. And they come together like this. And then they say, all right, take cover, take cover. And I'm like, what the fuck? And everybody's like, get down, get down. And you're, you're hiding behind, you're ducking down behind anything that'll like block. And they take these guns and they shoot them across each of the ship. And there's this thick fucking ball that comes shooting across the decks of the ships. And there's a little cord on the end of it. If the thing fucking hits you, you're dead. There ain't no way around it, right? So they shoot this thing across. Everybody's ducked behind, you'll hide behind gun things and whatever else, you know? And the ball hits and it's bam, bam, bam. It's bouncing fucking all over the place. And then once it comes down, these guys jump up and they grab that, that little like cord that it's on. They grab it and everybody starts pulling it. And the more they pull it, it gets thicker and thicker and thicker until finally it's a, like a thick rope, right? And they pull it over. And they're doing this on all different areas of the ship. They get shot over this way and they're getting shot over that way. And then they then they tying off the boat so this is keeping the boats the lines are keeping the boats from going apart you know and then the helmsmen are keeping them from colliding okay and that big wake's coming in the middle and and then and then they take the, then they, they pull over the gas line <coughs> and they yank that thing and they take the gas line hook it up <coughs> all right and they turn it on <coughs> they're pumping fuel over cross in filling up your ship and then they got this big like back then there was no no cell phones no there was no even any computers or any of that shit then like any, like, so they send this big net over. It's a big fucking net. And guys are pulling the net across these cables, right, from these lines. And the, and the net's got mail in it. And it's got some food supplies. And it's got movies. Because movies back then in the military, it was the old, where you're sitting in the in a chow hall and they just played a film movie. That's how it was back then. This is like, you know, all that. I mean, like I said, at A school, we weren't even on computers back then. We were using microfiche. I mean, that's how long ago, you know, I was in the military. Was, you know, now it's completely different. But anyway, they pull the things over. And then after, and then when they're done, they, they, then they unlatch everything, you know, and, and, the, and when everything's done and they undo the lines and you pull in yours and wrap them up and they pull and then the ships turn their music off and they kind of go off on their way, you know, and then the, the ocean settles back down again. Everybody goes back to work or to sleep, whatever they're doing. But it is a fucking cool ass experience to have. It is just, uh, it's something to, and I remember the, fir the first time I saw it, I was lucky because after we got the lines over and that, I snuck away and I got up on a part of the ship where I was able to just, to, nobody kind of knew where I was. And I sat, I was able to watch the whole thing going on from above, you know, so I was able to get the full experience of it. It was like so cool. So anyway, that was, that was, um, there was, uh, that was cool. So, I mean, I'm glad that I actually had that experience. And then, uh, God, where was I just going to say, oh, and the whole time I was in the military, there is one thing I can say that I did, even though I was fucking crazy, that I'm proud of, and it's not even a big deal, but. There was a, I had duty and there was an explosion on our ship and it just, you know, whole ship like, you know, shook or whatever a little bit, you know, it's a big explosion. They go over the thing. This is not a drill. This is not a drill. And the whole, the whole hallway just filled up with black smoke, just big black smoke. You couldn't even, you couldn't even like, you know, it was just, I couldn't see anything. And I had duty. So my job was with other guys I do, we had to go put that fire out. Okay. And I'm running into the black smoke, can't see anything. All of a sudden, I turned around, I'm running completely off the ship, I'm getting the fuck out of it. Then I realized, no, I was running into the smoke. I was doing it, okay? And then when I got there, 
fire was already out. Electrical fire is no big deal. We just had to put these stupid suits on and clean up. It was no big deal. But I always wondered if, if that's what it's like when people are like in wartime situations or something like that, where they're in battle and one part of them is like, fuck this, I'm done. But yet they realize they are still fighting. I wonder if it's kind of like that. But that was always a, a but the, the, I don't know what you want to call it, but that, that experience was, you know, something I had, so to speak, that I thought was kind of neat. Uh, but so there were so there, there were some positive moments when I was in the military when I could and the other thing like me too that even though I was completely crazy at that time because I ran into that smoke my shipmates knew they could count on me even though I was completely fucking insane it all matters when push came to shove and shit hit the fan I didn't pussy out man I fucking went into that smoke and I was gonna I didn't know it was gonna be big flames or what was gonna be there I went into it and I was willing to do what I had to do you know for my shipmates or whatever so at least at least that's the one thing I have for the, about the military. But anyway, uh, so then the next time we got back into port and I did go, I, then my, my doctor must have pulled something off because then they had to let me go because he must have been pissed off because this was like he was doing the last surgery. So he was probably pissed that he couldn't finish his work. I don't know. But I went back. Now I was in Bethesda and, and I get there. Somebody fucked up because they didn't even know, know I was coming. But then my doctor wasn't even there anymore. Okay, he was out, man. He had already got out. So that another doctor, and he finished the surgery up and it looked really good. He did a nice job. Okay, and then it got infected. Okay, and I think the way it got infected, I was with my nephew at the lake when I was home and he splashed water. I think the water from the lake got in my ear and it got infected. This big black goo is coming out of my fucking ear. It got, and it got worse. So then I'm like, fuck. So I go back, okay, and the infection's out of control. They have to admit me to the hospital. I got a fucking major fucking in his face, like eating away at my fucking ear. I lost like a third of my ear, okay? I said to the doctor at one point, I'm like, well, look, how bad is this? What's the worst that can happen? He's like, the worst that can happen? The infection we can't stop, it goes all the way to the brain and all the way to your brain and kills you. And I'm like, he's like, but don't worry, that's not gonna happen. We'll just cut your ear off before that happens. I'm like, all right, whatever. I really didn't give a shit to be honest, you know? I thought I'll put a fake ear on, I don't know. But anyway, I was in this, uh, in the hospital there at Bethesda, which was great. And uh, the guy next to me was in a fucking body cast, man. He had fucking cancer. And they had to take, like, one of his ribs and replace his thigh with it or something. This poor dude. African-American guy. Real cool. He's from D.C. Really cool guy. Then there was this other guy came in. He was in the Marines. And he, something was fucked up with his leg. It was funny because when he came in, he didn't have a limp. But then he developed a limp while he was there. And he was trying to get out of the Marines, I think. Then another guy came in, some Puerto Rican guy from New York, I think. He was in the Coast Guard. He got stabbed in some fight or some shit. But, uh, God, we have a lot of fun in that room, man, the four of us, man, you know. And uh, one night or one day I'm in there and this girl comes in there, African-American girl. And... Uh, she grew up in New Orleans, okay? And she, but she currently had lived in Pasadena, okay? And picture this smoke, really cute ass, I guess you would call it a Creole girl, you know, from New Orleans, you know? Like some Pouchet was there, less some French was in there, I would think, you know, Carolyn Pouchet, I think she, you know, that Creole French thing, you know, because New Orleans was a French country at one point, you know, that Louisiana, what it was, so just that, Beautiful, smoking hot, you know, Creole, just like, and she just had the big boobs and a nice round butt. And she walks, who's this cute man? And walks over to me. And before she left, she smacked a kiss on me. I was like, what? Anyway, after she came back another day, she goes into the bathroom with me. And I'm banging her in the bathroom, in the hospital, the naval hospital. I got an IV in my fucking arm. I think one time the IV came out or some shit. My roommates were like, yeah. You know, was, this was in the naval hospital, right? At times she was getting in my, she and she worked at the hospital. Okay. She she was a corpsman. She worked, and she's, she's like jumping in bed with me. And the, but this shit was going on like crazy in Bethesda. It was like a lot of this shit going on, man. It was just a, it was just a wild fucking thing. It was just like, you're in a military hospital, and the rules aren't the same. Okay, they're not. It's different. But anyway, uh, I, I I healed up, and there were moments too where. Like the four of us was much fun and we we're all young guys, but there were times when each of us had our moments. Like I remember the dude that got stabbed, he came back from, I don't know what it was, rehab or whatever they call it. And this dude had tears in his eyes, man. He had been in fucking pain, man. You know, something was hurting. And then I, the other the guy, one time I came back like that, because for first they were having a problem. They couldn't get the, they couldn't stop the infection. And now I was really getting worried, man. I was like, and I had been seeing some girl 
and ear I called her and I don't know she like blew me off or something I was just like I was devastated I was like but, that, but then I was just like sucked it up I said you're on your and I always felt like this I felt like this with OCD I said, I said to myself you're on your own there's nobody here for you no one you've got to just beat this thing on your own nobody's going to do this for you man you got to beat this thing and I did I just made sure they the, in the Oh, they were excellent at the hospital. They cleaned it out constantly, cleaned it with the, they mixed the antibiotic fluid with the flushing it and it worked and it cleared up. But anyway, cleared up and okay, whatever. But now my ears fucked up too, okay? <laughs> and that was another obsession. I had, one of the things that was fucking with me. So anyway, I don't want to get too far into this. Uh, so now it was like, I just wanted to get out, okay? I was like anything to get out of the military because I could not, I could not keep these rituals up any longer because they started getting bad again. And uh, I remember one night, and there was, uh, oh God, make sure you edit that name because that's not cool. I don't want to mention anybody's name. Uh, that's the girl I was seeing. But anyway, she had a side to her too, or she was, I'm not, I don't want to say anything negative about her really, but there was an incident once and it caused a major OCD attack for me. And like a friend of hers was like, it was just, it was gonna give me this big chocolate bar and she freaked, and she wasn't jealous, she's like, what are you doing? It just, it turned, and I had this major OCD attack. I was totally fucked up. I remember sitting in my car and I'm crying and I'm fucking, everything's, I'm just like a mess, you know? And uh, I'm just completely, just insane, crazy, completely distraught, don't know what I'm gonna do. So I just like, I just like had to get out any way I could. And I tried all these different things. I tried faking an ear hearing thing, all kinds of shit. It's ridiculous nonsense. And then I had the option. I, I saw a psychiatrist, okay? And man, do I regret this, okay? And I thought, maybe I can get, a, get out on a psycho thing. But now here I am crazy, okay? So I'm going to try to get, but I'm not really going to tell them that I am crazy, Okay, so anyway, it took a lot of guts and all that. I thought, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. So I had to check myself into like some mental clinic they had there, right? And when I checked in there, okay, I didn't know it was gonna be like it was. And right away, they like, I had to take off my clothes and they wanted to be put on these pajamas. And I was like, I was like, I was like, whoa, whoa, wait, I'm not, I didn't agree to this. I'm not doing, this. and they blocked the door with all these people. And I'm like, oh, fuck. I'm like, here it is, man, you know. Like one flew over the cuckoo's nest. I'm fucked. They're going to find out I'm really crazy and I'm going to get a lobotomy or some shit or who knows what's going to fucking happen. I'll be strapped down and get electrical shots. What the fuck do I do now? And I was slick to, when, when nobody was looking, I dropped my keys into my underwear. They couldn't see them. And I'm looking at the windows, windows that bar. I'm thinking, okay, I, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm planning my exit, how I can escape. And I knew if I had my car keys, my car was in the parking lot. If I could get to my car, as long as I got out of the building, I could get away. And I'm, I'm scoping out all the, you know, every way. So I'm like terrified, man. Anyway, needless to say, <laughs> I eased into it that night. And the girl I was seeing came to see me that night, which that helped. And she was cool, you know? And, uh, and uh, which that was really cool for her to do that. And anyway, then like these women came in and played bingo with us. I won like bingo five times in a row. And then they bring you like cookies and shit. And actually, you know what? Mental institutions ain't that bad. They're kind of nice, you know? Like when you're these people that are like, you know, on skid row and that and mental illness and they don't want to take their meds and they don't want to go to mental institutions. Let me tell you something. Mental institutions ain't, at least for me, that it wasn't that bad. You kind of ease into it a little. It's kind of pretty lax, you know? Like there's a lot of pity. You know, pity is very underrated. You know what I mean, man? Pity is very underrated. People pity you when you're in those places. Anyway, the next day, I had to go speak to all these like doctors and nurses, everything of the psych department, right? And most of the people in there were like, that was the hardest thing for them. These people they were terrified. But me, I'd never had a problem with public speaking. That's something I just never had a problem with. Okay. So for me to speak to these people, I'm like, bring it on. Let's do it, man. And I went in and I just laid out some bullshit. And I'm blah, 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 blah. And they're laughing their heads off. But the chief of psychiatry, he said, I can't remember how he worded it. And he said, what, is, what does that mean to you? And I said, uh, I said, you know, like, like not telling it straight like it really is. He's like, yeah. And I realized, oh, fuck, I didn't fool him. He knows. He knows I'm fucking crazy. I didn't fool this guy. And then, and I was like, I'm never going to get fucking out of here. And I left. But then the next day they let me go. I went out of there. But I did, I did talk to that guy again who was the head of the psychiatry department. He was a Russian guy. And I don't know if you know this, Russians are amazing wrestlers, okay? And I grew up in Pennsylvania. It was the great best wrestling state. We used to always talk about how we wanted to wrestle, wrestle, uh, how we wanted to wrestle the Russians, okay? And he, was, and he was something 
New, he was in the whole wrestling thing in Russia somehow because somehow it came up in conversation with us. And one point when I talked to him, I was talking to him about different guys I knew from the town I grew up in. Uh, that one guy won the national championship. Another guy was in the Olympics. You know, and we were talking, and he had said to me at one point, he's like, you should have been on the Navy wrestling team, which if I hadn't been crazy, I, I very, very easily could have been on the Navy wrestling team without a doubt in my mind whatsoever. And for a minute there, because he was a wrestler and knew about wrestling, I, 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 I trusted him. Like I trusted him, and I thought, this guy, I can tell what's really going on in my head because he knows about wrestling, and he, he'll get it. He's not, he's not like just some doctor's lot, but he'll get it. And I talked to my girlfriend about it. I said, I'm thinking of telling them what's, because she knew I was fucked up too. She didn't know what it was, but she knew I was fucked up. We talked about it, but didn't talk about it, but she knew I was fucked up. And I said, I think I'm gonna tell them. And she said to me, no, Steve, don't you dare. If you tell them what's going on in your head, they're gonna lock you up, you'll never get out. And I didn't tell them. And I wish I would have, because actually at that time, this book I read, The Boy Couldn't Stop Washing, they were doing the first studies on OCD and Bethesda at that time. I probably would have been in the book, okay? And if I would have talked to him, I, they would have helped me. I know they would have helped me. Anyway, now I never would have just like left the Navy and went AWOL. That, I would never have done that, I, I could. And then actually, another thing that fucked up, they were gonna send a, a guy, they were gonna send me to a new base. I was gonna get sent to California, which is where I wanted to move to anyway. But again, OCD fucked all, that whole damn thing up because I, I did something that I can't believe I pulled it off. I made a fake phone call to someplace and said, yeah, can we get, uh, we're gonna have Triola come up and stay here for a minute. And the guy, they fell, I couldn't believe they fell for it. So I got like 30 days off, like free, nobody knew about it. I just took it, they thought I was, one, I can't believe I pulled it off. But then I stayed over the 30 days. And when you stay over the 30 days, then it rings, a, a, they, they, then they take notice. And anyway, I got busted on that one, okay? So I was like AWOL 30 days, you know, which wasn't a big deal though, because it was funny because like, and Bethesda, because it was so laxed, where you went from your ship where it was more structured and more, when you got to Bethesda, it was so lax, it was so, it was, a, it was a joke with the guys, actually. You get to Bethesda, you start banging the women, you start chilling out, eh, and then you take a vacation for like 30, 45 days, come back. It was like, it was like, it happened so much. I saw some straight A squared R sailors, man, when I was in the restriction area. And I'm like, you're here, I can't believe this. He's like, eh, you know, I went back to New York for a while, you know, I went there. It was just so calm. It was like, it was just a thing that happened. You like lose your military bearing. That's what the chief had said on my ship. He lost his military bearing. That's why we have to keep him here. But you do. You kind of just lose that and you, you start feeling like you're a civilian. You don't realize you can't just leave for, you know, whenever you want and then come back. That's not like a job. You can just walk away and then, oh, can I get my job back? It ain't like that. But so it wasn't really a big deal. But at that point, then I was thinking that I, then I lost the opportunity to go to California. They were going to send me to Norfolk. And then I just thought of the ships and the smell. I just knew the, the, the OCD attacks I was going to have to contend with. I just, I couldn't bear it. So I went home on leave. And what I did is I just didn't go back. That's what happened. So I never would have just left. I did that. Anyway, okay, so now I'm out. And now to give you an idea of how fucked up I was. Now the Navy was my big fear, okay? You got to remember this now of staying in forever. It was so bad that... I, my, I took my sea bag, right, with all my uniforms and everything. I left it in the truck of my car. I could not even touch it. It would be fucking OCD attacks. Like, I couldn't even look at it. I just had to pretend it wasn't there. It was that, it was like, you know, it was just completely crazy. Okay, anyway, uh, so now I'm out. And I touched on this a little bit in the last one, but I really didn't get into it a whole lot. So here I, and another thing that happened too, when I was on my ship, I was always good about saving money. I saved up about close to like $6,000, actually almost $7,000. And I ended up buying this car. I didn't have insurance. I crashed it and I had to pay for it. And I, by the time I left, I, I, I had no money left either. I had a few hundred bucks left. And here I am. I'm fucking completely crazy. <laughs> I'm fucking AWOL. No money. I don't know what I was doing back in my hometown. I was just so, I was just completely fucked. I don't know. But, I, you know, like I said, you know, any rational person, you know, you would, real, you would realize, you know, what's going wrong in your, in your life. But I was so completely crazy with OCD that every day was just a challenge to, to control these OCD attacks. That's what it was about every fucking minute of my life. It was a constant thing. That's what it was. But anyway, that's when a friend of mine, I was staying at his place, these two, these two guys I'd mentioned earlier, a friend of his said, you know what, man? I know this lady. She has, she has a group of male strippers. You would be great for that. And I'm like, really? He's like, I'm like, yeah, I thought about that. He's like, no, you would. Let me get you. Let me introduce you. Let me get you an audition. And he set it up. And 
so I auditioned when they were performing at this club. And I was like, I didn't know anything about dancing. I didn't know nothing. I was just a good looking guy, right? With a nice build. And, and when I went out, I kicked ass, man. These fucking women went crazy. And at that time in like less than like what? Five, 10 minutes, I made like $35 in tips. Now in the military, I would work all week more than a week to make a hundred bucks. I just made 30. So back then it was like 35 in, in that shirt. And I'm like, holy shit, this is the way to make a fucking living. And then I, the lady didn't book many gigs. I didn't hear from her again. And then, oh, this is another thing that happened. Okay. I got this idea in my head that I was going to be a bodybuilder, which is ridiculous because I don't have the genetics for that. Never did, never would. A lot of people see me now that I have an okay build. That's because I've been lifting weights since fucking high school. I do not have the genetic ability for that. It was ridiculous. So I actually took steroids at one point. Okay. And that was another thing. Back then, you could get steroids anyway. It wasn't, it was anywhere. It was no big deal. It was just, things were different back then, you know? The first time I went to some doctor and he prescribed and then there was another doctor that did in my hometown. And anyway, they did, they did me no good at all. I got stronger. I was stronger, but not really much stronger. But I just bloated up. I didn't even look any good. So she, she called me for another gig once, but I was too bloated up. And it, it, it wasn't, I didn't do as well because I didn't, I didn't have my body that I had before. So I, so I pretty much stopped. And the thing that finally made me realize, look, dude, this whole idea of being a bodybuilder ain't going to work is there's a friend of mine. He was a state champ in wrestling, naturally built, and he came, I met, he came back, and I was as built as him now because he never lifted. And so he started lifting, and within like six months, he was fucking massive. Just, and I was just like, no, wait. Because you're reading all those stupid, I was reading all those like stupid muscle magazines, and then they sell you, they try to sell you all their products. Oh, if you do this and this, you, that's bullshit. You either have genetics to do it or you don't. This is like if somebody can train and track, to be a sprinter there in for 20 years, okay? But they ain't gonna run as fast as Usain Bolt because they just genetically ain't gonna run fast. You can have somebody study art. They can study art for fucking 10 years, the best art schools in the world, and then some kid that never went to art school in his entire life can just get out a charcoal pencil and whip out a portrait that looks it's just phenomenal because that's genetically what he can do. You know what I mean? There's all, everybody's got some. I always tell people that are like, you know, that, that don't know where they're going. I always say to him, there's something you got, man. You just got to find what that thing is, okay? Anyway, after that, it's like I was done with that shit. And then I just worked out to be in shape, and I really got in good shape again, trimmed down. And uh, the girl I was seeing, oh, this happened too. After the, the African-American girl in the hospital, I was hooked on black women, man. <laughs> I mean, I still like white girls and, you know, Asian girls, but man, was I just, I could not get enough black girls. I was crazy hooked on black women after that. That old thing, you go black, you don't go back. Oh, yeah, that's how I was. And I was with some beautiful African-American women, man. Uh, but anyway, this girl was African-American, and she said to me, you need to go to this place where they do stripper grams. And I hadn't heard of those, where you just go to like the birthday parties and that. And that's where I really started to shine. That's where I was really good. One-on-one -on -one with people, with my personality. You know, it was quick and fast. You're in and out, boom, money gone. Boom, the next one gone, boom. That's how you made your money. And then I started my own group of guys. I got guys at the gym that were built and really hands. I put my own group together, okay? And we kicked that. I put that lady out of business in like two months, man. She was gone. Because I just had, I just got big muscle-headed, really gorgeous guys. And I learned out of so I got a so because OCD kind of now I was in a kind of like I wouldn't say it was a remission but it wasn't there as much because the fear I had with the Navy was now gone okay so the OCD didn't have it like kind of like when I grew up the fear that you're going to kill somebody and then you have like the fear that you're gay once you would overcome those see OCD is always looking for something else something else to get you once you so I, I, I got away from the Navy so now that fear was gone but it, 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 you know so I'm okay but although this was weird I had all kinds of really weird dreams at that time that like People were chasing me, you know, and I was running the whole time when I was like, hey, well, and I'd be like running and I'd jump off a cliff and I'm flying and shit. All those, I was having weird dreams like that constantly. And I still, not so much anymore, but I still, I had been having weird dreams, other weird, well, I'll get into that later. There were other weird dreams too later uh, after I got out. But anyway, uh, yeah, I, I learned how to sew. I was, my girlfriend taught me how to how to thread the machine, how to do like a basting stitch, you know, the basics. Because she was very talented on a machine. Like she showed me this dress she made and she was like very, very talented. And so I bought a cheap Singer sewing machine for like a hundred bucks. 
That machine lasted me, by the way, like 30 years. Best investment I ever made in my life. I think I made this costume on that, on that machine. May, might have. Because I, I just recently, like a couple of years ago, bought a new machine. It lasted me that long. One time I had it repaired. But that $100 machine, I probably saved hundreds of thousands of dollars on the thing. So anyway, I learned to sew. I made my own patterns even. I made all the costumes for the guys. I made My girlfriend, she helped out too. I made the, like, the fancy costumes. So, so my group was like, Way better than this lady. Just had a few guys that danced, you know, on her little thing at GMC. We had the bow ties and the cuffs because I made the costumes and stuff. So anyway, but now don't forget, I'm AWOL now. So I kind of knew I had to get out of there. And I made it. I made all the money I lost. I made it back like less than a year. All the, it took me like two and a half years to save this money in, in the Navy. And here, as I taking my clothes off, I make it like that, like nothing. So at that point, I wish I would have moved out to California, but I did. But I moved to Tampa, Florida. Okay, I was gonna do it there. I got to Tampa and just about every place I went to hired, like, hired me to be, do stripper grams, but I hated Florida. Oh, that's a godforsaken, I don't know why people move there, man. It is, first of all, there's a million old people there, okay? It's hot as hell. The summer, it ain't just hot, the humidity is just unbearable. I hated it there. And while I'm there, OCD comes back to me. I don't even know how it was coming back to me, but it was pounding my head, and I'm completely crazy again, completely out of my mind losing it, you know. And I got up, and one night, I was just completely, it was just pounding in my head so bad. I got on my bike, and I just went rough for a bike ride in the middle of the night. It must have been 2, 3 in the morning. And I'm like, literally, just wanted to kill myself, but I but I couldn't do that. And I'm like riding my bike straight into traffic. Like cars are coming right at me. I'm going to drive straight into my, my bike. And at the last minute, I'd move out of the way. You know, the car's in his horn. Like, I'm like, fuck you, what are you doing? You know, what are you doing, whatever. And I came home I came home after that. And I don't know, man, I just like, I don't know, I just like laid down. or I don't know what it was. I just kind of went, I, I can't do this anymore. No more, I'm done. I'm done with this, I don't care. Another thing that would happen then was when I had OCD attacks, if I didn't give in to them and like keep touching something or keep saying something over and over again, if I just stop, wouldn't do it, my head would literally get like numb. I'd be in like a fog, kind of like out of it, literally. And I said, I'm not doing this anymore. And I thought of my little brothers, my two little brothers, I was, I was like, they don't even know me. They never even saw the real me. Cause I was fucked up, you know, so long. And I was just like, I'm not doing this anymore. I don't care, I'm just not gonna, I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna, you know, if my head's all fucked up and fucked, then I'll just be like that my whole life. And so I just didn't give in to the rituals. I didn't say whatever I had to say over and over again or whatever, I just did not do it. And the fogginess went away. And I was like, holy shit. And then the next day, bam, bam, I'm getting bombarded with the OC. I'm like, no, I'm not doing it. I said, I, you know, and then every time it would come back to me, I would say to myself, well, no matter what the attack was, no matter what the fear was, no matter what my brain was telling me I had to do, I would just say, nope, I said nothing. I said nothing, I'm not doing this anymore. And I fucking beat OCD, I conquered it. It was, I was myself again. I fucking did it. How I don't, then I'm watching Phil Donahue comes on and there's this guy flipping his light switch on and off, on and off, on and off like I used to do. And I was like, I just stood there stunned. I'm like, oh fuck, that's what I fucking have. And that's when I found out I had OCD. Okay, so anyway, after that, everything, my whole brain cleared up. I'm, I'm just starting to think straight like I did way, way back, like before I had OCD when I was like a young kid. Everything's clearing up in my head again. Now I'm being myself again. You know what I mean? I mean, I was very active in politics as a kid. I, I was very, all those things, you know, I was very active about civil rights. All of it all came right back to me now. You know, I even, I even like, at that time I was thinking I wanted to be an actor and I even went to some, took some acting class at some place and I memorized the, the script like that instantly, so quick, so easily. It just boom, because there was no distractions. The OCD was gone. So I thought it was gone. Anyway, I was gonna move to New York City. I was getting into acting there. And I actually got a job, and I don't know why I did. I also had a job offer in Philadelphia from a place that I worked in Tampa, and the guy asked if I'd go to Philly and work in his office at work there. I don't know why I didn't. I was offered a job in New York City, and I don't know why I didn't take that, but I was offered a job in Buffalo, New York, which I don't even know Buffalo, it's very inexpensive. And I was gonna be making close to the same amount of money in Buffalo as these other places. So I took it and boom, then the, I just kicked ass the money. And the, the lady that I worked for, she was like, she's an agent actually. And man, I, I was making money. 
within less than a year, I bought a house, bought two houses. Uh, and it was, it was coming in, man. Dancing? Yeah, just taking my, doing stripper grams, basically. And I'd put another group of guys together, but it was never like the group I had back in Erie because these guys were okay, but it never really kicked in with, for some reason with those guys, it just really worked well. So the other guys that we did, we just did okay, but it wasn't, it wasn't quite the same. Even the costumes were better than that, but I, but I was making my money doing these stripper grams, you know? And get this, okay. <laughs> now I say I paid cash for my first two houses when I was 25, which I did, but, okay, people are gonna love this. Two houses, both a story and a house. These were big houses, old houses in Buffalo. They were, one was 900 Eagle, was, other was 9, 193 James. They were sat like this, $9,000, two houses. <laughs> Can you believe that shit? <laughs> All right, then I ended up buying this, big, this bigger building. It was a commercial property with apartments, and then I bought a few other properties. But the problem with real estate in Buffalo, it's cheap. But that you can't sell it either, though, because the problem with the Rust Belt, all the Rust Belt cities, whether it's Buffalo, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Detroit, the Rust Belt is shrinking constantly. OK, everybody's moving to, you know, Texas, California, New Mexico, uh, Arizona. I mean, who would have thought Phoenix would have passed up Philly as the. Uh, fifth largest city in the country. Who, who would have, it's the middle, it's a fucking 130 degrees there. Who would have thought, it is, it's still growing like crazy. Who would have thought that would have happened? Although the dry heat's different than the heat in, you know, Florida. Uh, but I really liked Buffalo. I, I love, I liked, I loved Buffalo when I got there. I liked it far more than, than Tampa. I hated Tampa. I liked the former because, because the Rust Belt, especially Buffalo, it's got like a, let's put it this way. You got to be tough to live in Buffalo. You know, I remember the mayor said that once after a major snowstorm. And I'm talking, they're a serious snowstorm. I remember growing up through the, I mentioned this in the other video of the blizzard of 77. That In Buffalo, man, it's just like, you got to be tough because it's cold and wet most of the year. And that's why nobody can beat the bills after a snowstorm. If there's a snowstorm in Buffalo, okay, nobody's beating the bills, man. You know what I mean? Because it's like, nobody can deal with that shit, you know? There's a good documentary about the Bills when they lost the four I saw on Netflix the other day. I remember going to all those games, too. And that was the first time in my life where I was actually a Bills fan over a Steeler fan because I was always a diehard Steeler fan. But I really loved Buffalo. But again, guess what happened? OCD comes back. And this time, what it was doing, it was keeping a thought in my head. It wasn't that I had to say something over and over again. It was just pounding me and pounding me and pounding me. And then I'd get old. But at least I knew what I had. You know what I mean? I knew what I had, okay? So that made it all the much better. Because before you got to remember, I thought I was the only person in the world that did this shit. I didn't even know what it was, okay? And, and it just came back at me, and, 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 that, and now it was back, okay? And I controlled it the best I could, but I had, uh, I don't want, I'm not going to get into the whole, I don't want to get into too much of this stuff. There was one, one OCD attack. I had it so bad that I had this beautiful loft I built. Okay, I had the two houses, and, I, and, I, and what I did was I, I cut off the top part. I built this really nice loft up. That's another thing. I learned how to do carpentry and just tools. I just taught myself how to do all this shit. Okay. You know, I mean, you, you gotta take, you're talking about the guy that was in the Navy. He was so completely fucked up. He's like mopping floors. He can do anything else. Okay. Now he's AWOL. He gets over being crazy. Right. You know, he, well, you know, he, he learns how to like, that could have been a tailor. Well, I would have had to go to school to be a tailor. But he learns how to sew me. I learned how to do carpentry. I'm running a business. I'm 22 years old, completely insane. And I'm running a business. I'm dealing with restaurants and clubs, booking gigs and you know, all that stuff. Oh, but anyway, in Buffalo, the agency that I work for, she was making a ton of money too off of me. She was doing well, but she was doing good before me too. And she was the nicest lady, but we hit it off so good. And she goes and she hires this asshole for a manager. And this guy starts giving me shit right off the bat. And I didn't want to do it, so I said, fuck this, man. I left and started my own company. And again, I kicked ass. I made a ton of fucking money, probably more than I even was making with her. But the thing was, now I had, the, had all the bullshit to go with. I'm running the business, too. Where before, I didn't have to do that. She handled all the bullshit. I just went and did the gigs. So, you know, there's that. But anyway, uh, then... At one point, oh, I know, I was going to talk about this OCD attack. I had an OCD attack so bad that uh, I couldn't go back in my house, in my life. I could not go in there. If I went in there, I was terrified, like shaking, you know. And, I, and I've, I've read things about people that have had that happen with OCD. And I wonder how many people are homeless that have OCD because they have an OCD attack and they can't even go back in their own home. I mean, it's literally, it was, you know, it was that bad. So I, ended up, I went to Toronto with the girl I was seeing then, a Jamaican girl then. So anyway... 
I got out of dancing, which I can't believe I stopped doing it. Okay, but I was thinking I was getting too old. I was 29, I was thinking I'm gonna be 30. That's this thing I was getting kind of too old for. I definitely shouldn't. I, I was making so much money doing almost nothing, okay? I mean, I literally, at times, would, would, would bring in like close to like over $2,000 a week. That's back then, okay? That, that would be like today bringing in probably close to five or 6,000. And you're working like maybe what? 15, 20 hours, if that, sometimes, you know, you're not even, not even that, you're looking maybe 10 to 15 hours and you're bringing that kind of money. I didn't realize it. So anyway, I got out of the business. I shouldn't do that. And right off the bat, it was a disaster because first I lost some money in real estate. I went to some auction, bought stuff I shouldn't buy, didn't lose that much. And anyway, uh, and then I was, the girl I was seeing, we were going through a whole weird thing and she kept wanting to get married and get married. And I didn't want to get married. At one point I did, I was going to marry her. Okay. And I knew right away when I asked her it was a mistake, though, but I was going then. Right after I said I was going to marry her, all of a sudden, I said this in the last video, all of a sudden I get a call from my stepfather that, oh, the, uh, the police are there looking for me. Like, you know, the Navy's looking for me now. F am I right? uh, well, coincidence? I'm about to marry a girl that's black. Well, she's half black, half white. All of a sudden now, they've never heard from anybody in like, what, eight years? There's, it's like... <laughs> Am I stupid? Like, I don't know. And I never really found out exactly what did happen. He probably did try to turn me in. They probably just said, fuck it, because they really didn't. I think it's like if you get a traffic ticket or something, they find out you're AWOL, then they'll just send you to the military. But normally, they don't really look for you. It's not like a, they don't give a shit. It's not like a war going on or anything. But anyway, so now I'm freaking out. And I had to, like, uh, just gather gather up everything. I got to my lawyer right away, and I'm like... Had to get my money out of the safety deposit boxes, and I'm doing just all kind of I'm putting the, the houses, I think, in, I don't know if I put them in her name or what, I don't know what I did. But anyway, I went back to the military, and it's just crazy. First, I go to Bethesda, because so I'm thinking, I'm just going to tell them I got OCD, you know, because there was at one point I figured it out when I was reading about OCD, and I realized that, wait a minute, dude, you didn't do anything wrong. You were completely crazy. That's what happened. That's why you left. You were nuts. And I knew I would always go back. You know, so anyway, I go back and I get to Bethesda and I was like, I go to the, and they, and they really didn't want nothing to do with it. I go and talk to, went to the psych ward and that. They really didn't do anything. And the, and the guy just gives me a ticket. He's like, hey, you know, we just gave you a ticket. Your, your last uh, duty station was Norfolk. You just go back on your own. We trust you to go on your own. I'm like, okay. So I, uh, you know, I hop on a, you know, a plane or whatever, a plane and I uh, flew into Norfolk. I get to Norfolk, right? And... First to go through the gate, I didn't have any idea or anything, right? And I think I just, I don't know if I even just told them I was AWOL or what, I don't know what I said. They just, they're just like, just go, just go, just let me right in. I'm like, I didn't even have my military ID. That was the one thing I couldn't find was my military ID. And I think this guy knew that I made a mistake. I told him about that. And I never should. I think he took it or something. And I told one girl that about that. My girlfriend knew too, but I never should have told anybody once I had changed my identity and all that. But anyway, uh, so then I go, I'm trying to turn myself in, right? And I go to one guy and I go to one, to, they're sending me, I go to one area and I'm telling this dude, no, nah, man, I've been AWOL for like eight years. I just want to turn myself in. And he's like, you want to turn yourself in? And I got long hair then. I had real long hair. He's like, you sure? You sure you want to do that? I'm like, yeah, man. I just want to, you know, I want to turn myself in. He's like, all right, well, come with me. He's like, you sure you want to do this? And I couldn't fucking believe it. I'm like, yes, I want to do this. And you would think you'd get there and they'd be like ready to handcuff you or something. So he takes me another place. I go through the same thing again. What? Really? Are you sure? You really want? I was like, I was finding it impossible to just fucking turn myself in. I fucking couldn't believe it. I'm like, what the fuck? You know, finally, they, they, they're like, oh, okay. And they accept it. They do this and that. And the next day. Everybody's nice, everybody's friendly, everybody's cool. They take me and give me all these uniforms. They get me a new ID. They start paying me again. They put me on the payroll. I've been gone eight years, but that's okay. We'll start paying them again. I'm like, what the fuck? They give me a meal pass. I'm eating these great fucking meals in this amazing chow hall. And then I couldn't believe this is the, the, this is the next day after I get out, right? We get done with the thing and they're like, okay, well, just be back, you know, on Monday for work. I'm like, I can just go? I'm like, yeah, yeah, just be back Monday. I'm like, I'm like, what the fuck? I get on a plane. I fly back to Buffalo. I see my girlfriend. We go over the border. I'm in Canada having, uh, having dinner at an Asian restaurant, and I'm in the military. I'm like, what the? <laughs> what did? I'd been AWOL for eight months. I'm like, what the fuck is this? It was like out of a fucking movie. Like, how does this happen? But anyway, as I went through the military, and I talked about this in the other one, I just kept telling my story, and every single person through the chain of command was like, oh, my God. Holy shit, that's what our, and everybody understood. 
And I did go back, and the time I was back, I served honorably. You know, I was even doing well because now I didn't have OCD. I had OCD still, but I was doing, I was, didn't have me, I never had, I didn't have the fear of the Navy anymore. They're putting me in charge. A trio is going to be in charge of the work detail. I'm like moving right. I'm getting like ace and inspections. I'm like, because now it's a whole different thing. I'm working, and I went to SK school. Guess where I end up working? In a warehouse with SKs. Is that like completely incredible or what? I, 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 I got drunk. I, I couldn't get through A school because of OCD. And now here I am all these years later. Where am I? I'm working with SKs in a warehouse. And the chief was so cool. And it was so laxed, man. We would like, first you go to breakfast in the morning, this massive, you know, any kind of omelets, any kind of eggs and, you know, donuts and, you know, bacon and, you know, sauce, anything you want, you know, fruit and everything. And we go and we like, we chill out at that little, uh, uh, you know, the little then the warehouse until the chief came in. We'd go out and maybe like, because there usually wasn't much to do. He'd like maybe pick up some trash in the yard, maybe move a few things around in the warehouse. That was, you know, it was, and then and we'd go to lunch for like two hours, another big, huge, massive buffet lunch. And we'd come back, hang out for like an hour and, and we're off. And I, I, my girlfriend and I were living in a, at a hotel on the beach in, in Virginia Beach. And she's at the, you know, we're, it was like crazy. It was so, and I'm going through the whole, the full whole thing. But I did have some moments where it was kind of like, you know, I had made a, I had made a mistake once. I went to salute a female officer. I remember she was pregnant. And I remember, because I, I, I'd been gone so long, I didn't remember exactly how the rules were that you had to salute indoors or outdoors or when there was a roof over you. There was a roof over us, but we were, but we were uh, outside. I wasn't sure, so I just saluted her. Maybe I wasn't supposed to. I think she took it the wrong way, like I was being disrespectful. And then she went to the warehouse to sit with the chief. But the chief was so cool. He called this other guy up. Oh, and then when she saw me, I had my hat on. He called a cover in the Navy. I took it off so I looked bald so she wouldn't have recognized me anyway. And, uh, and he called the other guy. She said, that's him. He's like, I don't know. She just left. It was no big deal. But at that point, I was like, oh, God. <sighs> you know, what am I going to do? I got to get out because I'm going to fuck up. I don't want to, you know, something's going to happen. And I was really kind of, I had a really good attorney and a lawyer. This guy was great. Uh, and anyway, so he got, he got me uh, a, uh, I can't remember what it was called. I just had it on the top of my head too. Uh, it was, I, I did go to a panel of a group of people and they would decide, they would hear what happened and they would decide what type of discharge I would get. And I told my story and they all, in the unanimous decision, honorable discharge, got discharged. I've been a veteran since. So, you know, at least, but I, I think I said this in the last video. I, I do, I do regret the fact that I wish, cause I only had like another year and, I don't know, maybe a half, not even that left, only a year and a little bit of time, you know, time left. And I you could have just finished up and got, you know, just, you know, got an honorable discharge like that. And I wish I would have just stayed in and done that or tried. However, I don't think I could have because I, because I don't even think I had that option if you have OCD. I know, I know I looked it up now that you can't even get in the military if you have OCD now. You can't even get in. I wouldn't even got in. You know, wouldn't it wouldn't even been a possibility. Even though that would would have even been a possibility. But I think I might have been able to just like, I, I think I could have maybe you know, stayed in there. And I wish I would have done that. But I, when I did go back, I served honorably, you know, I served back and I did what I intended to do. So, you know, that's just, just the way, you know, the way it goes. Anyway, so then after that, oh, and get this, right away, the first day I get out and I leave the base, what do you think happens? Of course, a fucking major OCD attack. Only what's it doing this time? It's telling me I have to go back in the Navy. Completely opposite before, forcing me out. Now it's forcing me, you have to stay in. Or it's to, because of something that I had said or something. But I knew now that I had OCD and I knew what it was. Now, granted, if I didn't know what OCD was, who, like, like it would be like then if I went in and I just stayed in, people would think, oh, he loves it. That's why I stayed in. But no, OCD forced me to stay in. Same exact fucking thing, opposite scenario happens. And that OCD attack fucked with me for about two weeks. And it was, it was pretty, it was a bad attack. Uh, but I just kept working like crazy, like crazy, like crazy on some property owned until I shook it. But anyway, uh, so then after that, my girlfriend and I were going through some weird stuff. Uh, and uh, I ended up opening this big candy store in Toronto, okay? And uh, Candyland. And it had like a thousand different kinds of really crazy candy in an ice cream parlor. And it had like cakes and sweets in that. And it was a disaster. I lost so much money. It was like, the place would be packed with people, but those kids were stealing more candy than they bought, <laughs> okay? And it was just like, 
And anyway, I closed and I opened it in Niagara Falls. Still a disaster. Then I had a building in Buffalo. It was mine. I opened there and I didn't even have rent or anything. And it still was a disaster. And uh, so now I, I still, I was like, and I lost, uh, I'm not broke. I'm not broke. But yeah, I am broke. But I still own a couple properties. Okay, I still have some property left. Uh, and a lady comes into my candy store one day looking for a clown, right? And I said to her, I go, you know, I could probably do that. She's like, yeah, I see you with these kids. You're really good with the kids. Why don't you do it? Why don't you do it? And so I did the party for her. And I was like, maybe I should, I should do this. Because I wanted to find something, like doing stripper grams, I like the idea that you just show up, do your gig, boom, get paid, go. It's not like you get up every morning and go to work and have a job. And I wanted something like that where I can just like do the gig, make the money and I'm done. Okay. And as a clown, you can still, it was still basically the same kind of concept, only it was a lot harder and you had to work. I didn't pay as much. And it was like, it was like a lot more work. And I started, I was well, basically, I just acted like a kind of like a fool at first. Okay. And, and, and they, people liked me, but when I compared to how I was then to the way I perform today, it's like not even close. It's I'm like, I'm actually a professional clown. Now, another thing that I didn't, I didn't, that I didn't really talk. I talked about in the last, uh, video was like, yes, I, if I hadn't had OCD, the odds of me of ever being clown probably a million to one. I probably never would have. I would have went to college, I'm sure of it. And I may have been a lawyer or something of that sort. I, although I may have got into theater arts, that's possible. I could have, you know, went, you know, uh, forward with a career in, uh, you know, theater arts and theater and that, uh, that, that's, that's very possible. Uh, but I, See, actually, I'm having an OCD attack right now. I don't know if you noticed that when I stopped. I was having an OCD attack because I was trying to look for the right word that I wanted to say. Okay, it wasn't forward. I wanted to pursue. That's the word I wanted to say, but I couldn't get it out and came forward. So I had an OCD attack right now as we were talking. It was beating in my head telling me, you got to find that word. You got to find that word. You got to find that word. You can't keep going. You got to find that word. You got to find that was just now. That was an OCD attack I was having. Okay, and I was trying to shake it. Okay, but anyway, so I still have them all the time, even with medication, but I just have one. But see, now I've said that first, I thought of the word pursued so I could move forward, but that's something like that could just fuck with you. But anyway, I might have pursued a career in theater or something, but I don't, I don't want people to think that I don't enjoy what I do for a living. Okay. I wouldn't keep doing this if I hadn't enjoyed it. Now, granted, I thought I'd only do this for a couple of years, so I didn't think it would turn into a career, but I'm not going to lie. It is fun. I mean... Especially if I show up at a preschool and I got all these little like three, four, five-year-old tots, man, and I come in and I slip and fall or the table falls over and they're just laughing their heads off. And I get, I just get into that rhythm, man. I get on a roll, you get in a zone and it's just fire and fire and they're just going crazy. It's a blast. It is an amazing way to make a living. I love it. It is fun. And I did, I just, from the last video, I, I, I think people might've got the impression that he really doesn't like what he does. But no, that's not true. I love what I, I wish it paid more, made more money doing it because it doesn't pay. It pays okay. Actually, as a clown, it pays very well if you look at it on the short term, okay? Because to make like, you know, $200 a gig is very easily, okay? That's not, I mean, that's, you know, and that's only for like a couple of hours. So if, you, I mean, if, if you just do it by an hourly rate, the pay is very good. But the thing is, you're not, you're not, it's not like you're making $200 or, or even $100 an hour and you're working every hour, eight hours straight making that. You know what I mean? So that's the thing. And you can't, like, with doing stripper grams, you could do a ton of stripper grams because you're in and out in like, you know, 15 minutes, boom, the next, boom, the next. But as a clown, you actually have to perform. You have to have the car, the costumes. We had to have costumes as a stripper, but it's not the same. And you had to have some acting and, you know, because you'd, different skits you would do, but it's not like a clown where you got to really perform. Okay. It's a lot more. So it's, you don't make as much money because you can't do as many gigs that you would like to. And it seems like everybody wants their party, like on a Saturday at, you know, two o'clock too. So then you might work some before or after whatever, but I just, you know, but I do enjoy it. I love it. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's uh, it's, it is a really great way to make a living. Now, something else that happened during this time. Now, since I lost, uh, I lost all that money. Okay, on that candy store, right? Okay, uh, something else happened. Okay, before that, when I was making a ton of money, taking my clothes off, uh, that's another thing too, like back then, like male strippers was a brand new thing, okay? 
that had, you'd never had that in history before. And women were going crazy over this new thing. It was like like part. Of, it was actually part of the women's movement, actually, where like men always went to see strippers. Now women could do it, and it just went crazy. You were doing them. I mean, it swept the country. You know, good-looking guys doing this were making a fortune because it, it's not like that today. I don't think guys today make shit compared to what we made. Uh, but anyway, uh, so, I, so I lost a ton of money, and then uh, my whole attitude changed. Before it was about make money, make money. I changed. I wasn't like that anymore. I didn't. I wasn't like consu uh, consumed with wanting to make money. I wanted to have a comfortable living and be okay, but that was no longer a thing. And then I became a socialist, and I started reading about like Eugene Debs, Big Bill Haywood, you know, all these great socialists. And I still, I still, uh, I'm thinking this morning of the men in the mills and in the factories, the men in the mines and on the railroads, of the women who have a paltry wage are compelled to work out their barren lives. Okay, I'm not going to go into the whole thing, but I'm, and, I, and I and I started educating myself. I read tons of history books. I read, and, and I became a full-fledged socialist, man. I was against the capitalist system. I was against, like, money. I was like, it's not right. That, you know, I, I was thinking things like, what gave me the right to own property and somebody else has to pay me to live in a, in a home? I'm like, that's bullshit. That is not right. That is wrong. You know, I mean, it was like my whole... Everything completely changed. I took on two little kids that didn't have a father. I took care. I did everything with those kids. I, 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 you know, I bought them their school clothes. I Christmas. I had tons of presents for them. I bought them their bikes. Taught them how to ride their bikes. Snowboarding, snorkeling. Taught them how to swim. I did everything. With these kids. I would go on trips. I traveled all over the world. And I would go to the most impoverished areas of countries, the Nairobi slums, the Smoky Mountain in the Philippines. I'd buy big, massive bags of candy and throw them out to the kids and have like little mini parties for them. I would buy clothing for kids. I would feed in India. Like I went to this one place and there was like 20 little homeless, 20 kids are starving. They're homeless. I'm like, there's like a guy selling food. I'm like, feed them all, man. I'm, I fed every one of them. I, I did. I mean, I lived the socialist life, man. I mean, I, I literally just like, that was my thing. I was no longer about money. Although, you know, but I did come here. I bought a condo. I sold the last of my property. And I came here and scrounged up as much money as I could and tapped out credit cards. I did buy a condo, you know, and I got it paid off, you know. So I was okay. I still owned property here. And I was doing okay still as a client. I still was making money. I was traveling. Yeah, you know what? I was supposed to, like, be taking my make off while the whole I did time. this. Yeah, well, anyway, yeah. I just got, like I said, I start talking. I just start, you know, getting into this whole thing. But anyway, uh, yeah, travel has been one of the great joys. I've had so many adventures. You know, I urge everybody... If you don't travel, get out there and see the world. And it does, it's not that expensive. I mean, some places are expensive. Like, uh, I went to Japan. That's expensive. But Japan is amazing. It's just, you know, I got a lot of clown music there in Akabara. That's the anime district. That's where I heard AKB48. I was like, wow, this would be good clown music. Uh, I went to Nepal. The last three trips, like, working on this museum, the only vacation time I took off was I spent, I took three weeks, I went to Japan, I went to Nepal for about a month, and I went to Australia for a month. Last year, I went to Australia. That was a disaster. I wouldn't say it was a disaster, but it rained every day, every day. And then even when it, you had a day where it was sunny, there was like one day that was sunny, I went to Bundai Beach, and I was expecting, like, you know, maybe rent a surfboard, you know, great ways. I haven't been on it, because I don't surf, really, but I surfed, like, a, when I was in Hawaii once, a real easy way. So I was thinking of doing it there, and maybe at least a boogie board. I bought a boogie board. The waves were, the waves were horrible. It was, like, flat, and I was like, what is this? Are you kidding me? California has better waves than this. And then I got, I never get sunburned, ever, never. I got burnt to a crisp. I mean, I was fried. I was only in the sun for a few hours. And then, of course, it was raining by night. Another thing about Australia, I will say this for Australia, those are some of the nicest people I ever met in my life. They all call you mate. They always me, They were like really cool people. Not to say there wasn't some cool stuff. They're like all the little inlets and stuff like you take the ferries around to that were neat. But it just rained a lot. And, uh, oh, uh, went to the Great Barrier Reef, okay. Now, I'd never scuba dived before, so I was looking forward to scuba diving. And I'm thinking, okay, the Great Barrier Reef, that's supposed to be like the mecca of scuba, right? Oh, man. There was no colored coral. There were hardly any colorful fish. No sharks or, you know, stingrays. Nothing. I mean, I've been snorkeling in Hawaii and uh, Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt and Zanzibar. Uh, Belize. Belize, man. I was snorkeling in Belize, man. There's like big sharks cruising by you and big ass stingrays. I mean, I was, and I was snorkeling. I remember I was in there and I see this massive shark go cruising by and I like, I like stood up. I looked at the guy next to me and he looks at me. I'm like, 
was that a shark? I'm like, yeah. And you, you know, they don't mess with you. Though. You get used to it. So I thought, you know, the Great Barrier Reef, this is going to be amazing. No. You know, but I heard that so many people, first of all, it was raining, and they said that keeps the fish away. And people told me that there's so many tourists that do that now, and all the tour buses come to the same spot. They said to do it right, you have to, like, rent a private boat, take you way on the other side of the reef where there's nobody there. That's, you know, that's a real expensive, because Australia was super expensive, too. Most expensive trip I ever went on. It was cost a fortune. But, I mean, there were some good things. I saw some cool stuff. I did do one thing that was interesting. Okay, this is crazy. This was the highlight of my trip. There's always a highlight of every trip. This was my, some trips, there's a lot of highlights. It's just funny that, oh, what it was good though, my last night there, uh, I was in uh, Chinatown, it was the Chinese New Year. That was fun. Okay, but another thing that was bad there, like when I stayed in Japan, I stayed in the capsule hotels. And when you go in those, you're not even allowed to walk in the place with your shoes on. You have to put your shoes like on a rack, right? And you put on these slippers, just to even enter the hotel. Okay, you go in and then they give you these pajamas to wear. Everybody wears pajamas. It's filled with like Korean and Japanese businessmen. It's immaculately clean. The pods are in beautiful, perfect condition. There's air conditioning. You hook up your phone. What it just the 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 showers are beautiful. There's big, huge shower rooms with a big, huge jacuzzi and a steam room. They got a big lounge with those chairs that vibe. It was just great. So then when I was going to Australia, I went online to look for a hotel and I saw they had capsule hotels. I'm like, oh yeah, this wow, they had those in Japan. This is great. They're reasonably priced. It wasn't Japan. It had nothing like Japan. You, right when you enter the lobby, it's like a shithole. The capsules are cracked and broke. The air conditioning didn't work. The bathrooms were filthy. But I'm a member at Anytime Fitness, and you can use gyms anywhere around the world. I, would, I wouldn't even take my showers in those places. I, went to, I literally went to the gym and took my showers at the gym. It was that bad. It was just filthy. I'm like, oh, my God. And then another hotel in, uh, I think it was in uh, Melbourne. I think I pronounced that wrong, though. I was corrected on that when I, no, when I was in Australia. Anyway, but uh, I, I booked it through Hotels.com. It said it was a hotel. I find out it's a hostel when I get there. Now, when I was like, you know, 19, a hostel would have been fine, but not at my age. I didn't stay in a hostel. And I said to that, look, man, the guy was nice. So I said, I apologize. You know, I, I thought this was a hotel. Do you mind if I find it? He's like, yeah, we'll refund you. No but I couldn't find anything because the Australian Open was going on. There was no hotels. But it actually didn't turn out too bad. I met some really cool, like, young people. And there was just a lot of young people, you know, that were traveling. And they would work there and whatever. Uh, not, not to say that you – know, oh, there were – okay. At least I will, back to what I was going to say about Australia. I did go to a nude beach for the first time in my life, which I'd never been to one. I kind of cheated, though. Because I didn't take everything off. I went in the water first and then I took off my swimsuit, which really isn't like, you know, what you're supposed to do. Uh, but I did end up, I ended up, I ended up going out of the thing and was naked on the beach. After a while, you get comfortable. You don't think anything of it. And at first, it was what you would expect. You know, a lot of big fat guys and a lot of gay guys. Guys, and not that I, because they're gay, you know. Uh, the lot of, it, it, and there wasn't like hardly any, weren't any hot women or anything. Then all of a sudden, some really hot women started showing up. I was, I was like, what the fuck? I couldn't believe, I mean, really beautiful women. They're just like taking it off. And I was like, holy shit, what is this? And I see this one girl, this Asian girl sitting up on a rock, nothing on, just up beautiful girl, man, just gorgeous. I'm like, I'm going to go up that way. But I had my shorts. I don't know why I did it. I just kept my shorts on. But I went up there and I kind of, she was probably, I don't know, maybe two, maybe three feet away from me. And then these two other girls came over. And I talked with them. They're from Argentina or something. And they just, like, they didn't, they just took off their tops. Though. They just went, like nothing. And uh, the other girl, Okay, it was right next to me, right? I couldn't believe this, right? I could stop, and I'm trying not to stare at her, right? At one point, I mean, there was no reason for this at all. I, I just couldn't believe she did this, okay? <laughs> She's literally about three feet from me. She gets up, okay, turns around, and, and just like completely faces me, looks right at me, faces me, like, like I'm looking at you. And she just on her knees, okay? No, I think she was sitting, and she just, like, spreads her legs wide open, right in front. I couldn't, I was like, what the fuck is this? Didn't say anything, just didn't, just, like, just, like, let it hang out. Kind of like she was just like, yeah, this is what I got. And I was like, okay, does this chick want me to bang her? What's the, I don't get it. And then, I hope this doesn't sound too vulgar, but it's true. She gets up, and I swear, there was, like, vaginal flu was dripping out of her. I mean, literally dripping out. I'm like, oh, my God. Does this chick like want to get laid? What is this? I, I didn't know how to react to it. And I'm like, 
you know, so that anyway, since I'd been talking to other girls, at one point I got up and I did talk with her a little and she was from Tahiti or something, but it didn't seem like there was anything. And then she just got up and left. And I'm thinking she probably does that all the time. Probably goes down there, knows she's hot, and she probably gets off on these guys like, like going crazy looking at her, you know, and then she just goes home and laughs at him. You know what I mean? That's, that's the best I could think. I couldn't believe it. Oh, but anyway, that was like the highlight of Australia, you know. But then you've been to Thailand. I have. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Thailand, now, Thailand, okay, I didn't go to Thailand to get laid for the sex thing. I knew about it. You were the only guy then. Yeah, uh huh? You were the only guy then. I, I went with Lauren. Oh, the, oh okay. I, I, went, I went with Lauren. You went uh, with a girl who, who, that who, who works with me sometimes. Oh, okay. And I told her, it's like every single guy you see here is only here for one reason. It's here for sex, yeah. Okay, I thought about it, but that wasn't like my main reason. I, I thought, I knew it was a puzzle, but I wanted to see the bridge on the River Kwai because I like, you know, history, the floating village, the temples. I did want to see all that stuff too. And the girl thing was kind of in the back of my head, but that was not my main reason to go. I'd been all over the world, man, you know. I just got my last trip before that, I was in, I think, Kenya and Tanzania, which was amazing. Uh, but anyway, I'm in... Uh, I did all, you know, I did all the tourist stuff, the temples, as you know, they're amazing, the detail and everything. Uh, the bridge on the River Kwai. There's another thing, like, like the, the bridge, people that aren't familiar with the bridge on the River Kwai, that's from World War II, when uh, it was like an internment camp where the prisoners were forced to build this bridge for the railway and all these men died. It was just like a horrific thing. But anyway, you can go on that bridge now and it's like, you can walk across it and it's like, it's like so dangerous, you know, the old rotted wood. You could fall right there. Like, you could never do that in the United States. That's one of the things like the U.S. It's like, we're too crazy with regulations. Man, I hate that. But anyway, I'm in Pat Pong. You're probably familiar with Pat Pong. Mm. Pat Pong Pat Pong is like, it's got like the tourist thing with the shops and all that, but also has like strip clubs around it. So I'm like, well, I'm here. I might as well at least check one of these go-go bars out. So I go into the place, right? And right away, man, I'm like sitting on some stool and this smoking hot girl just comes up to me. And we got some music out there. This smoking hot girl comes up to me and just looks me in the eye. She puts her back to me, okay? Pulls up her shirt, takes my hands, put them right on her breast, then puts my hand right on her crotch, puts her head back like this and says, do you want to go with me? And I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know? And then her, her girlfriend comes over and she says, well, my girlfriend to come too. And I'm like, oh my, I don't believe it. holy shit. So anyway, we go back to my hotel and they're like, you know, sucking on each other's boobs and whatever, you know, and so, uh, so I just had another OCD attack. So I was going to say tits, but I thought no boobs is more appropriate for them. My, my, that's anyway, I'm going to stop doing that anyway. Anyway, so they're like sucking on each other's tits and whatever and doing the thing. And the one starts going down on me. Okay, and then the other one lifts my leg up and starts licking me like, you know, like where the sun doesn't shine, like right there. And I'm thinking, where am I? Am I like in the nexus of pleasure? What, what, what is this? And after that, I did get hooked on the sex over there. Because then I'm like the girl, the gorgeous girl come up and give me some massages and I'd be banging her. And then I went to another place just for massage. I was looking for sex. She's like, you want to have sex? You want to have sex? I ended up banging her. And then I met this girl, Noi, who was just Gorgeous, oh my God, I, I fell in love with this girl. I'm sure it was lust, but I fell in love with this girl. And I was just hanging out with her. And anyway, that Thailand is just a whole nother thing. And then I went to the Philippines after Thailand and met another girl there, the whole same thing. But I did have one experience in, in, uh, in Thailand. Okay, check this out. I was, uh, I don't know where I was, I was walking down some street or something. And there was this like really pretty girl and she's like leaning against the car, you know? And, I didn't know if she was a prostitute or what. She just might have been just a nice girl. That's another thing, too. Everybody thinks it's all prostitutes. It's not real. I had, like, there's, like, regular girls, too, that, like, hit on you there. Like, there were girls at my hotel that were, like, like hitting on me, kind of, you know. You could, well, you know, they were. There's one girl from the hotel she was, like, she, which I saw her in a car. She's like, where you? She was going. So she's like, where are you going? I mean, it was like, it's not, it's just so open. You know how it is. You've been there. Sex is just so open in Thailand. It's like, no big deal. But anyway, this really pretty girl. She's like leaning against the car and I kind of looked over at her and she saw me, we made eye contact and she smiled and I watched a little Fred turn around and she smiled again. And I can't remember if she called me over or what, but I walked over and I'm talking with her, you know, and we're hitting it off, right? And she's really beautiful. And, and, it's, and you know when you get to that point when you meet somebody where it's, and then you get to that point where it's about to happen, you're like gonna start kissing or something and then where's that gonna lead? You get to, I, we got to that point kind of leaned forward I, and I thought we we're gonna kiss and she put her hand up and stopped me. She said, you don't wanna kiss me. 
I'm like, yeah, I do. She's like, no, no, you don't. I'm like, yeah, I do. She's like, I'm a man. I'm like, she didn't say she was a transsexual. She didn't say she was a lady boy. She said, I'm a man. Okay, now here's the thing. She tells me she's a man. All right. I'm still aroused, though. So now I'm thinking, oh, great. Now I'm gay. This is all I need. I got enough problems in my life. Now I'm a homosexual. You know, <laughs> I'm still, you know, I'm, it doesn't matter. You know, my dick's still hard, even though she told me she's a man. You know, I'm still seeing these beautiful breasts staring at me in the eyes and these beautiful legs. Great. Now I'm gay. That's all I need. <laughs> anyway, then we just like that parted after a while. And I like, probably went to a bar and picked up a girl. I don't know. Oh, good God. But as you, you've been there. You, you You've had a couple lady boys on your show. I've interviewed I've seen. them, yeah. You have some beautiful women, man. You can't, you know. Anyway, that's just a whole nother thing. But uh, yeah, t traveling is the thing. I was in India once, and this is a neat story. I, I, I was in India for like a month, and I, I started in uh, New Delhi and, you know, all around Rajasthan, all Udapur, Yodapur, Varanasi, you know, the whole, all that stuff. And I was in, and I got this idea where, okay, I want to go to this, just a small, tiny town where there's not one tourist, where no tourist goes. I found, like, one on my map somewhere. Because back then, you weren't, nobody was using phones to get around. Everybody had maps, and everybody had the Lonely Planet books. That's how it used to be. And uh, so I find this. I'm on a bus somewhere, and I get off in the middle of this little nothing town. It's, like, just a crossroad. That's it. No buildings, no nothing. And there was, like, one building. And I was like, asking me, is there a hotel? And they're going, oh, yeah, over there. So the guy takes you up to this hotel. Oh, my God. I mean, I, I can sleep in a shithole, but this was unreal. The toilet was busted in half, and it was completely filthy. It was just unbelievably filthy. Just I was like, I, I, the bed, God knows what I would have crawled up my ass in that bed. Who knows? But I, I, was like, I was like, yeah, Steve, this was a great idea, but nah, you might want to, you know, head back into Mumbai or something. So I go back to find out. Where, I don't even know where the bus stop was, you know? So I so I go back into the town, or back outside. I'm kind of looking around, and there's like, there must have been about 100 Indian dudes, and they're all just like looking at me. Not threatening, but they're all just like looking at me. You know, like, what's, what, what's this? And they all just like all around me in a circle, they all start closing in on me like this. And they're looking at me like I'm an alien from Mars or some shit. Literally, that's what it was like. And they're getting closer, and I'm like, all right, what's this? But not threatening. They weren't threatening. It was like they were curious, like, what, what? Look at this, what's this guy? What, what, what's he doing here? What, what, yeah. it was like, and they kept closing in closer and closer and closer. And I'm thinking, all right, how do I handle this? What do I do? What do I do? And they're closing in on me. They're almost all completely surrounding me, engulfing me. And this guy breaks through the crowd. He grabs my arm and he pulls me out and he's yelling, I'm, get back, get back, get back, get back. And he pulls me over and he takes me to this place. He goes, wait here, the bus is here. The bus will come here. Just wait here. And he's yelling, he goes, get back, leave him alone. Get back, get back. So he like, <laughs> he like saved me. But they weren't threatening, though. It was like they were just, like, curious. I don't think these dudes ever seen a white guy in their life. I, I Seriously, I don't think they – I think I was, like, probably the first, like, you know, guy of European descent that they ever saw. It was literally – because I was in this little town in the middle of India somewhere. And I don't think these – they probably never left their town. And it was like I was a curiosity. They weren't threatening. You know, it wasn't anything like – I don't know that they would have started poking and prodding me when they got closer. What would have happened? I was another thing in India. I was in another little town. I was on this bike. I, I find that's one of the best ways to get around places when you travel is on a bike because a lot of cities are so easy to get around on a bike. So I always would like rent a bike or sometimes buy a cheap bike. And I think I'd bought a bike in India and uh, I wanted to go to this old fort I'd, I'd heard about somewhere. And uh, it wasn't like, a, it wasn't a fort where there was like, you know, you know, you pay a ticket in the tour. It was like a fort, it was just an old abandoned fort. And I parked the bike downstairs, no lock or anything, you know, just there was like a lock to lock the whip, but nobody steals anything. It's not like here, you leave a bike out here for, geez, 30, uh, a minute or two and it's going to be stolen. And so I start walking up this, this, this like paved road, like twisted like this up the hill and walking up it. And I realize that, you know, it's like a long walk, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm just going to cut. I'm not going to keep going on this. I'm just going to walk straight through the field and go up. So I start doing that. I say, then I see a sign that says, beware of leopards at night. I'm like, oh, shit. But it's daytime. So I keep going. Then I start seeing all these snake holes. I'm like, oh, shit. A cobra's going to come out and bite me or some shit. All right. So I figured, all right, you better stay on the, on the trail. So I got back on the trail and I get up to the top. I get to the fort. And there's probably a couple other people up there when I got there. And I'm, I'm like hiking through this thing. It's like, you know, real cool, you know, very like medieval and just, you know, neat. And I hike all through the thing, you know, and then I get to the end of it. And it's getting later in the day and I just kind of lay down and relax and I fell asleep, right? And I woke up and the sun's coming down. I'm like, oh shit, it's gonna be dark out. 
within like fucking 20 minutes, it was fucking pitch black dark. Couldn't see anything. I get out on this road, have no idea how to get back, where the trail is. I'm like, oh shit, what do I do now? So the first car that I saw, I stood in the middle of the road, put my hands up, and I'm like, I'm making them stop. Fuck this. So the guy stopped. There was a cab driver. I think he had two Americans with him, right? And I said, hey, look, I'm lost. I don't know how to get to the trail to get back down to the town. You know, can you help me? I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, get in, get in, get in. I got in the thing, and he drove me up ways. And then he goes, oh, right here. This is where you just take that straight down. You'll get there. Still couldn't see anything. Still pitch dark. But I knew if I was on a hard surface, I was going the right way. So I started walking down. And, you know, maybe every now and then I would veer off of it and feel grass or, you know, or field or whatever it was. And like, oh, no, you get back on the trail. And I'd keep got back. The bike was there, you know, and got on it and pedaled off to wherever my hotel was. <laughs> that happened to me in Myanmar, too, once I got lost. I was at the temples, you know, watching the sun go down. Same thing. I got lost. I didn't know how to get back to the main, like, to the main road. From the road, I knew how to get back to my hotel. Again, I saw a little house way in the distance with a light on. So I just... You know, pedaled on over to the guy's house. I'm like, hey, I'm lost. How do I get back to the main road? You know, and the guy's like, ah, no, nah, just, just go down this way. Yeah, you know, no, no problem. And I got on the road. People will help you out when you travel. You know, there's so many people like it. The thing about Americans when they travel, like they'll book a tour. All right, so the whole tour group will meet at the airport. Then the whole tour group gets on the plane. Then the plane lands. The whole tour group meets again. Then they all jump in a little shuttle bus and they all go off to the hotel. Okay, breakfast is at six o'clock sharp tomorrow. And they all meet at breakfast. That's not travel, man. You want to travel, just fucking throw a backpack on and fucking go, man. Just do it. Don't worry about it. Nothing's going to happen. Something does happen, so what? That's part of the adventure. This girl I met in Morocco. Little tiny, she's been up here three times to see me. If I was ever to get married, I would marry this girl. She's the toughest girl I ever met in my life. She's from Mexico City, which she lives outside of Mexico City in Toluca. And uh, she's like four foot 11, weighs about probably 90 pounds, travels all over the world by herself with a backpack. She skydives, she mountain bikes, she's been in shark infested water, she's been in shark. This girl is not afraid of anything. She was up recently, because she went up here three times, we did the, the parks in Utah. She's scaring the hell out of me, man. She's hanging off of cliffs, jumping from big boulders on me. I'm like, I'm like, like get a picture of me over this one. She's like, I'm like, I take her name out of that. Uh, I'm like, what are you doing? Don't get so close. She's like, she's like, she's so many guts. When we were in Grand Canyon once, we were done at Grand Canyon, we went somewhere else, and we were hiking up some river, by some other canyons, and man, she fell hard. I mean, she came down on those rocks, bam! And she just sat there for a minute. She just rubbed her side, and she, she always says this too. She says, ah, you got to live the life. You got to live the life. And she just gets up and shakes it off. Toughest girl I ever met in my life. But anyway, I met her in uh, Morocco. Uh, we stayed in touch hiking. That's another thing. It, it's it's easy to meet people when you travel too, like women or guys too for them. It's so easy to meet women because you'll meet other women that are traveling by themselves too that are single and you have that common thing already together that you travel. So it's very easy. You meet people and then you just start hanging out. You'll be traveling together. Uh, and, then, and, and then, you know, there are other countries where they just dig that there's an American guy so they're attracted to that. You know what I mean? So you can meet foreign women. So that's, it's just so easy. I'll come back here. Like, geez, my God. It's like, well, I've worked so much. I don't have, it's hard to even have a date ever. But it's, it's, when you travel, it, it's so much easier. Plus when I travel, I'm more open because you're not worrying about work and opening a museum or anything, you know, that kind of thing. But yeah, travel has been great. I did like Ethiopia, for example. Oh, I got to tell this, this. I'll get back to Ethiopia. Okay, we're talking about when getting lost on trips. I was in Egypt, right? And Egypt's amazing. Have you been to Egypt, by the way? Never. Amazing. Like the temple or the, the, the pyramids and oh my God. I was in a pyramid. I was the only one at the top of the pyramid. If you just whisper, it echoes all through it. It's just incredible. Uh, you know, so I did, I did a month in Egypt and, uh, you know, did, went, drove through the desert. Like we did this, we're going through the desert. You swear this truck is going to tip over, man. It's just mounds of sand. And you're going straight down. I mean, you just, you just swear this, this is going to tip over. Because I went snow, uh, sandboarding up there. And, uh, but anyway, I was, uh, I went to this camel auction in Egypt. It was outside of Cairo. I'm in Cairo. And first, like my, my Lonely Planet said, you had to go to like, I think it was Lonely Planet where I got it. You had to go take the last the, the furthest train out of Cairo, okay, the furthest one out in the subway. So I take the, the, the furthest one out of Cairo, then you get off there, and then you got to take a bus 
to some other town into to the camel auction. And so I get on this little mini bus and it's filled with all these Egyptian dudes with like the long beards and the whole wood canes. It looked like you walked out of the movie, The Ten Commandments. I swear to God, that's what it was like, man. So I get on this thing on this little mini bus. I stuff in here with these dudes, real cool guys. You know, they really didn't think anything of me, man. They weren't even like, you know, just kind of, they were going to the camel auction. They didn't give a shit, you know. So we get to this camel auction, right? And they're beating the hell out of these camels. I couldn't believe these. And they got the camels. They got one of their legs tied up so they can't run away. And the camels are limping around. And and the, and the cam, they're hitting the camels. The camels are ah, screaming, trying to bite them. And I got the word that like a small camel was like about 100 U.S. And a large one was like 200 U.S. But anyway, so I, so I do the, you know, the camel auction was cool. So then after the camel auction... I'm like, I don't even know how to get back to Cairo. I'm like, you know, and then some guy just kind of calls me over and he puts me in this station wagon, right? I was like, oh, there, 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 let's go with him. Yeah, 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 I'll get you back. So I get in this, so I'm thinking he's going to take me back to Cairo, right? I get in the station wagon. I don't think the guy drove for maybe 10 minutes, if that. And he just stops. He goes, okay, you get out now. I'm like, oh, that, this is it. He's like, yeah, 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 this is it right here. And I'm like, oh, okay, uh, well, where, how do I get to Cairo? Where's Cairo? And he just points down the road. No, it's down that way. It's down that way. I'm like, what the? I'm like, okay, hey, thanks for the ride, you know, <laughs> whatever. So I get out, so I'm like, all right, well, how long is this going to take? And is this going to get me to Cairo? And, you know, what time is it? And how late am I going to get there? And, you know, I don't know. So I just start walking. And uh, all of a sudden, man, these little kids are in a little cart filled with cabbage couldn't have been more than nine or ten years old as little kids and they're just getting pulled by a donkey or a mule or something the kids are like come on come on come on and i jumped on the on the wagon with the kids and the kids took me all the way into town took me all the way into cairo you had great experiences that way <laughs> yeah it was cool just yeah. by meeting the locals yeah yeah i love that you know uh ethiopia like i said every time i go to africa it's just amazing i've done kenya tanzania zanzibar ethiopia morocco egypt ethiopia is if I would tell anybody a, a country you definitely want to see before you die, Ethiopia is phenomenal, just unbelievably beautiful, man. It's so. So anyway, I was I got to Ethiopia, and uh, I was going to climb the Simeon Mountains, okay, and I go to the uh, the place they had to get a permit to climb. So I go to the permit office in this little town below the mountains. I can't remember the name of it, and I get there, and the guy says to me. Go find Katie from Canada. I'm like, I'm like, what? what do you mean? He's like, no, no, no. Go find Katie from Canada. So I'm like, what? The f so I leave and I'm like, what's he? I'm like, is there like a Canadian consulate or something here? What? Does he, you know, what's? I don't, you know, I didn't know what he's talking about. And the first white girl I saw, I said, are you Katie from Canada? And it was Katie from Canada. <laughs> okay. I'm like, yeah. For some reason, I was at the permit. They told me to find you. I don't know what's going on. They're like, yeah. I'm like, I'm just gonna climb the Simeon Mountains. They're like, yeah, we're climbing tomorrow. I'm like, I don't know what he what he wanted. So we all go. To the permit office, and the guy's like, oh, good, you're all here. No, you three go together. He, he put me with them, so it's cheaper. The three of us go together. You know what I mean? This is, Ethiopia is a very impoverished country, and here this guy's going out of his way to save, you know, a couple, they were from Canada, a couple Canadians and American guys some money. I mean, you know, some, some real genuinely cool people, you know what I mean? So anyway, we, we take off the climb to the Simeon Mountains, and uh, uh, you, you hire a mule man that takes all your, like, tents and stuff that you rent, what up one side and then I mean, did we have yeah I think we had tents I can remember just sleeping bags or tents I think we had tents and uh and then you hike up yourself and you have to bring a a, a guide because you'll get lost and then a scout comes with you a guy with a gun in case a wild animal comes out or something you have to have that too and so we start to hike and it's a hell of a hike and uh we were so not prepared we didn't bring enough food we didn't bring enough water and we were like getting toward the end of the day hiking and man we were just like we're like in delusional. We're like, we're just like, we're falling over laughing our heads off and just because we hadn't drank any water and it's hot as hell. And then uh, we finally get up to the top. And there was this little place, a little hut, and they had some water. So we got some water. So we were okay. And we slept up. We got to one point and we slept and it was freezing at night. You wake up and everything's frozen. And then in the morning, it's hot as hell, you know? But anyway, it was just the views were amazing. Just, oh my God. And we went up to the top and then I think it was like, Slept, I think, three days, two days up, and then one day. I think we spent three nights there in the, in the Simeon Mountains. And uh, 
They, they call the Simi Mountains because it's filled with these huge monkeys. They don't even look like monkeys. They look like baboons. They're huge, and they got the big, long, long, thick uh, brown hair, and like the, the big mass of fangs, you know, those things. And, and there's this one. He was, like, s just sitting down. I was like, I'm going to get right next to this dude. You know, so I'm slowly just sat down, and little by little, inch by inch, I took my time and crept over top of sitting side by side, this big, the guy thing was about the size of me. It was that big. And I slowly took my hand, because I said, I want to touch this thing, man. Touch a, this wild simian. So I take my hand and I touch his fur, right? He jumps back and he looked me right in my eyes. And I swear, he looked at me like, dude, you don't know what you're doing. I will rip your fucking face off. You don't even think about touching me. That's how that thing looked at me. And I was just like, Okay, and I slowly <laughs> crept away. In retrospect, I would never do that again. So stupid. But one of the reasons I did it was when I was in Kenya, a lion sat down right by the Jeep, okay? And I could have touched it, and I was like that close. And I actually had an OCD attack. I remember having an OCD attack that was keeping me from touching it. But also, probably the reason I was having the OCD attack was there was another part of me telling me that eh, this thing could grab your arm and rip you out of this Jeep and kill you too. So I, that was part of it too. I could have touched it, but I didn't touch it. And I always regretted that because I could have touched a wild lion you know, in Kenya and I didn't do it. You know, and I was, So that's why I did it. But I would never, ever do that again. That was like so stupid, you know, just really dumb. But like in Kenya, I was at one point, I was in, I think, Abadir National Park. And I was in a Jeep with these African dudes and they're chasing this big, huge elephant, man. It was like a National Geographic special. And they're like laughing, hitting him on his ass. Hey, you big elephant. And they're hitting him. And we're like the Jeep's going right by the other. The elephant's running next to us. And we're it's just incredible shit, man. My God. And then in Ethiopia, okay, the next day we were, okay, Katie Thomas and I, we, we, we did the Simeon Mountain thing. Then we were all going to Axum. Axum is an old Roman town because Ethiopia used to be part of the Roman Empire. And uh, it's got all the old... Uh, what are they, you know, the pillars, the, I don't know what they call those, obliques or whatever they're called. So it's like all kinds of Roman ruins everywhere. So that was the next place we were going to go. And uh, I was going uh, to, I, I, I was leaving, I think, at early, a day earlier than them, I think, maybe. And I was going to take a bus, okay? In the middle of, like, I don't know, it must have been five in the morning, again, pitch dark. I get to this, this taxi driver, whoever it was, drops me off, like, in the, in the middle of a field, Right, there's a whole bunch of people around me. It's not like a bus stop, you know, where there's a building. There's not no building or anything. This is you're we're like in a big field. And there's like I don't know, maybe a hundred or more people around me, and I'm like, okay, I guess I just stay with the crowd. You know, I don't know. And then all of a sudden, the whole crowd just takes off running forward. Everybody, I'm like, what the? So I, I don't know. I just run with the crowd, right? I don't know. And then they stop. I'm like, okay. Then some more time passes everybody here's running again i'm like all right so i follow him and this happened like three or four times and we stopped okay and uh then the sun started coming out and i guess i didn't realize what was happening was each time we were running we were going to a different waiting station closer to where the bus pulls up that's what was happening but i didn't i didn't know that because it's pitch dark i didn't know it was you know but I, then i realized that's that you know after after i did the whole i realized oh that's what we were doing we were running so anyway, uh, the bus pulls up. Everybody rushes to the bus, and somebody I feel somebody pushing me, right? And uh, I'm like on my back, and I got picked. I get on the bus, and I realize my wallet was still. I got pickpocketed. And, I, and there was no money in there. There was just like 10 bucks in there, but I had a credit card in there. And then I had a couple of pictures I didn't want to lose of the two little boys I took care of. That bummed me out. I lost, I lost those pictures. Uh, and Because uh, one of them was like a really cute picture of this little guy. So that bummed me out. But... Uh, but then I was like, okay, so now I got to, uh, so it's like I had to get off the bus now because because of the credit card. I had to go cancel the card and go back to my hotel. I'm like, shit. And then when I got off, the girl couldn't believe, she said, you're getting off. She couldn't believe I was getting off because people, it's, I guess, hard to get on the bus. And the guy gave me my money back for the ticket. I didn't even care. It was like, I don't know, the dollar fifty or some shit. I don't know. It's like, oh, we usually don't, but, you know, well, I'm like, I didn't even care, you know. So I go back to the hotel. Call the credit card company, blah, 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 whatever. I just canceled the card. I had another card. It was not a big deal. And, uh, but then I'm like, fuck this. I'm flying. So I took a flight to Axum. Got to Axum. Checked into a nice little hotel. Now, Axum, okay, it's run on generators, the city, right? So it, like three days of the week, say the north side is lit up. And then on another three days of the week, say, or four days of the week, the uh, other side of the town is lit up, okay? So anyway, I go into town, right? And uh, 
I met this couple uh, from France and she had her laptop and she was showing me her pictures. They just went to the Lower Omo Valley, okay? And I was just like, I couldn't believe it. I was amazed. The pictures were just phenomenal. I mean, it was like, you know, the people with the plates in their mouth, just like, yeah, completely like the way they lived like 2,000 years ago. Just absolutely amazed. I was like, oh man, no, I gotta go. This, this is, it, it just know what I have to. So I head back to my hotel and guess what happened? Boop, lights are out. <laughs> that part of the town doesn't have lights this, this night. And I'm like, how oh, am I gonna find my way back? Oh my God. But I did, I find my way back. I walk into my hotel and who's standing in the lobby? Katie and Thomas, <laughs> who would have thought? So I said to them, I'm like, look you guys, you, you got to see these photos. I met this couple from France and the Lower Oma Valley is phenomenal. You, I'm telling you, because we were going to go to the Rock Hewn Churches next, which is a big tourist destination too. Like, I'm telling you guys, let's, so we went into town and we found that, I found that couple again. I don't even know how, but I did. Okay. And I was like, oh yeah, my friends, show them the picture. As soon as they saw the picture, it's like, oh no, 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 we're going. Fuck, whatever, I don't know, whatever it costs, whatever we have to do, we're going to the Lower Oma Valley. And the word was that they were going to be building a road that went down through to the Omo Valley, okay? A, a highway was gonna be built, okay? And the word is that once that highway is built, okay, then all those cultures are gonna disappear, similar to like the way the Native American cultures disappeared here once the highways were in and the railroads came in, that stuff just vanished. So, that, the, so the word was, if you're gonna go to the Omo Valley, the lower Omo Valley, and you really wanna see this culture, you gotta go now, because it may not be here in you know, five, 10 years. All right, so we had to rent a four-wheel drive truck, a guide, and then again, you have to bring a guy with a gun just for whatever you know, reasons, something might happen. And uh, it's, it's, you get down there and first we visit the Hammer Tribe and they were having like, we slept in their camp and they did like this, they had like a dance or something at night. We, it was just, we were the only ones there. There was no other tourists around. And then we went down and then anyway, then we get to the, the, the Farsi Tribe and like these are nomadic people. They don't take any money from the government or anything. And they live just like they've lived for thousands of years, man. It's just, it's, the, 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 just to experience that was just incredible, man. You know, and then to make things even better, while I was in Axum, I'm in this little bar. I don't even call it a bar. It's like a little shack, and there's this beautiful girl in there, and she's selling beer out of a cooler, right? It was Fetla, okay? Didn't speak a word of English. I didn't speak a word of Ethiopian or Farsi or whatever the language is. I don't know. Okay, but somehow we hit it off, and we're laughing and getting along, and she came back to my hotel with me, right? We hit it off the next day. I went to see her again. I'm like, wait, why don't you come with us? And she's like, mm. I'm like, yeah, why don't you come? She's okay. But she said, you have to meet my mother first. Cause I, you have to meet my, so I had to like, get approval from her mother first. If she could come. Right. And so, uh, I met her mom, you know, and she figured I was a safe guy. She said, yes, you can go. Now this was good for her too. Cause she again lived in this little tourist town. Okay. And so for her going to Lomo, that was an adventure for her too. It was like something she wasn't used to. So she came with us. So I got this beautiful Ethiopian woman with me while I'm traveling through the lower Omo Valley. It just, and she, oh, it just, that's another girl. I fell in love with her, man. I wanted to pay for her to come over here and live with me. Just, oh my God. You experiences know? like that, travel, travel experiences like that are the <sighs> antidote to racism. Yep. Ignorance and hatred. Yep. I, you know, I can, like, I keep talking. I haven't even changed into my regular clothes. Oh, here's my makeup thing. Uh, I never could understand racist people at all. I just, I don't, I never could get that whole thing. Okay, how can you like? If you're close-minded. Yeah, how can and, you and tra not, travel opens your mind. I know, but like, how even without travel, how can you like just see somebody that has different features from you and different mannerisms and just a whole different culture? How can you not like that? That's how you experience life. I love people of different cultures and experiences, you know? I mean, I just, I never could understand that for the life of me, you know? You know, that's the one place where the founding fathers in this country totally fucked up, okay? They should have ended slavery when they could have, way back then, because all they had to do was say, and at that time, slavery really, I mean, it was, it was the thought that in the South it was gonna fade out anyway, because slavery, it wasn't until the cotton gin was invented until it actually became really institutionalized in the South. You know, I mean, it was for tobacco and things, but it wasn't, it wasn't until the cotton gin. But all they had to do was just like, hey, look, Britain brought this shit here, not us, which is true. The colonists didn't bring it there. Britain brought slavery here, not us. They said, look, we're starting new our own country. We're done with this shit. I mean, they could have like 
paid the freed slaves, you know, like they were doing to the immigrants working in factories. Well, they didn't have factories then, but whatever, like, you know, a nickel an hour, which is not good either, which is bad, but at least you have your freedom. That's a whole different thing, you know? So it really wouldn't have hurt anything economically, you know? I mean, not that that's good either, but that was the one time, the one thing that they really fucked up on. They could have ended slavery right then and there, and then this country would have been completely different on race relations. You wouldn't have had the Civil War, you wouldn't have had Jim Crow, you wouldn't have had to have a civil rights movement. Uh, African Americans would have more pride because it would be, not that they don't have pride in themselves, now of course they do, but I'm saying they could have more pride in the country saying that, knowing that they were in a country that said, a new country that said, no, we're not gonna be part of Britain because Britain has slavery, we're gonna end it. It would have been a whole totally different thing. You know what else really gets me? I don't know if you knew, check this, okay. After the Civil War, I mean, you've heard the thing about African Americans were supposed to get, you know, the 40 acres and a mule. You've heard that one, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, all right, they had all these extra mules, okay? And so they were gonna, they were gonna give them, give them the, uh, give them mules and 40 acres. You know what land they were gonna get, the 40 acres was? It was all the beachfront property in the South. Because back then, beachfront property wasn't worth anything because we were an agrarian economy then, okay? And so beachfront property, you couldn't grow anything in the sand. It was shit property. That's what they were going to give the slaves, all the beachfront property in the South. Do you know how much that fucking land is worth today? The beachfront property in the South, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina. African Americans would literally be the wealthiest people in this country today. Fucked again. You know I figured I'd probably, I'd share that, share that yeah, story Yeah, your stories too. are great, Steve. So anyway, I guess we can wrap this up then, you know. Steve, uh, you're, you're, you're. Th thanks all, again for having me. You're always fascinating. <laughs> Thank you very we, much. We'll do it again one day. Thank you so much. You got it, man. Okay.